over here and welcome back to another uh, live stream. We are going to be continuing where we left off with the teen's guide to world domination. <clears throat> Advice on life, liberty, and the pursuit of awesomeness by Josh, by Josh Ship. Now, I did read the first two parts of the book yesterday, last night. So this is a continuation of the book as we venture into the final two parts, and then afterward, I will be revealing the next book, and I'll, of course, be post doing a community post on this. I'll be posting the next book that I will be reading after this one. So, without further ado, let's begin. <clears throat> I'm also going to uh, put this to where it's on live chat, so that way I should hopefully see everything and anything and everything. All right. <clears throat> Continuing where we left off on the book, we are, we're on, we are on part three. How to Dominate Your World. Chapter 14. You and what army? Welcome to your world, fledgling hero. Now that you know who the villains are and have successfully confirmed that you are not one of them, you'll notice that your world is completely and utterly overrun by the bad guys. Villains call the shots. They run the show. They are sneaky. They are powerful. They are destructive and deceitful. And they are everywhere. They hold the vast majority of humans enslaved to their will. Ah yes, your world is a hostile place, infested with villains and fraught with danger. So, here is your mission. I do hereby charge you to go ye out into the scary outer darkness of the wide, wide world and slay the horde of invincible ghosts, devious ninjas, merciless pirates, controlling robots, bloodthirsty vampires, brain-eating zombies and perilous little puppies by yourself, using only your bare hands and an herbal tea bag. Godspeed! Live long and prosper. For like 15 seconds. Let's face it, you don't stand a chance against all those villains. Not on your own, not with a tea bag. So listen up, because this is good, sweet news. The whole world is not out to get you. It's not. Your world, although filled with villains in disguise, is also home to a whole posse of people who will watch your back in a, punt, in a pinch. You don't have to fight all your battles alone. In fact, it's best if you don't try. Here's the thing. As a hero, you don't have the right to, dem to dominate anyone else's world. See rule number two. But you can help them dominate their worlds, and they can help you. Being a hero isn't just about not being a villain or keeping out of people's way. Heroes are team players. Allies, sidekicks, mentors, sensei, confidants, co-stars, call them what you will. You can recognize your teammates by the general goodwill. You'll find allies everywhere in various forms, but they'll always have this in common. Selfless concern for others. Allies are fellow world dominators who have become so good at beating back their own villains that they want to help you succeed too. There's hero, they're heroes who want to help. The truth is, you'll never make it on your own. Seriously. You need others to help you, to learn from, and help you up when you stumble. And if you're one of those people with the agility of a mountain goat who almost never stumbles and who rarely makes mistakes, don't get cocky. They say pride goes before a fall for a reason, you know. Instead, help others along the way. They'll be thankful. You'll be a real hero, and you'll have someone to learn on, to lean on when dark days eventually come. It also feels good. In your life, no matter what your plan or goals, you're going to need others to help you get there. The self-made man is a myth. 
Bill Gates didn't build Microsoft on his own. Michael Jordan couldn't have beat the Lakers to win his first NBA championship by himself. Without others, Albert Einstein would have just been a really smart dude with awesome hair. This whole idea of you gotta do it yourself is complete and total garbage. Seriously, the very best way to learn to do something, to do anything or be anything is to get a mentor, a coach, someone to encourage you, someone who's been there, done that, and got the overpriced slightly faded two sizes too big tourist t-shirt to prove, to prove it. My life would seriously be lame without the, men, the mentors I've had. I have a group of friends who, with whom I run 40 miles a week. Yes, I'm a beast slash marathon runner. No more husky jeans for me. Don't they, just, don't they think of something more dignified to call those? When these folks took me out for a run the first, f the first time and kicked my butt, I, was, I wanted nothing more than to find some friends of my own age who slept in, played Nintendo all day, and ate Cheetos. Seriously, I do love Cheetos. If only they came with a the, with the moist towelette. But, they, but these guys have helped me push to be better. Helped push me to be better. The point is that the miles were run, although it's fun, now that I've stopped wheezing. It's the hilarious, challenging, honest, direct, inspiring, random conversations we have when we're together. These guys and gals on Team Running Revolution have become some of my best friends. And each of them, yes, even you, Eric, have taught me something important about being a good friend, having a family relationships, business, business dealing with disappointment, and what 5 a.m. looks like. <clears throat> my wife, Sarah, has taught me how to trust. My foster parents have basically taught me everything I know, and I think one day I will owe them a kidney or something. Jamie Oliver has taught me about business and life balance. Frank Kern taught me about packing my message, packaging my message in a way that actually gets people to listen. Kirk, lies be Kirk has been the big brother I never had. The guys at Dot and Cross saw the big picture way before I did. Point is, you need a mentor, a coach, Maybe a posse. At the very least, you need to find someone doing what you want to do really well, or living your indis or li or living how you want to live, who will reach you how to get there. But how do you approach this precision? Do you poke them on Facebook, or do you call them email them? E or do you call them email them? Hey, I'm some. Hey, I'm some kid. What's up? Here's the lowdown. Step one. People of awesomeness are busy. Don't waste their time. Go, get, go to them prepared, organized, and humble. Step two. Reach out with a plan. Here's, what I, here's who I am. Here's why I think you're awesome and I want to learn from you. And I have six specific questions I can email you if you don't mind. Step three, continue to invest in that conversation. Offer to buy them coffee or, blu or, or lunch. It will be money well spent. Treat your allies well, and don't just expect them to be there for you, be, be there for them too. Often, other allies provide more than help. As personality, er, as people, we actually need other people just to keep us from going crazy. And now, a lesson from history. By the time he was third, by the time he was 30 years old in 1935, Howard Hughes was one of the last, one of the richest and most famous men in the world. He built an empire, producing big budget films and daring odd actresses, picture a cross between Steven Spielberg and Brad Pitt, and was seen and was one of the mega celebrities of this time when he did what he wanted, even if it was risky or reward. He, when the Wim stuck to him, he finally, uh, he wanted to fly around the world, and he did it. At time war as time wore on, though, Hughes became reclusive and began to slip into mental illness. He became obsessed with the size of your penis. 
Wow, Forrest! That's not what the word was, you dumb motherfucker! <laughs> oh my god, I'm so sorry! <laughs> oh my god! I'm like, I'm like, uh, I'm being like, uh, uh, Steve Harvey. Every time somebody says something very adult and questionable on Family Feud, where I'm like, you did not. I'm like Booker T thinking like, Bruh! Bruh, tell me he did not just say that. <laughs> okay, take the ness out of that word, because that's exactly what was supposed to be said. I, I can't believe I just said that. <laughs> Somebody is going to make a short about this. This dude made, this dude said, what? <laughs> Somebody's gonna make a short about this. I already, I, or at least a clip. I already expect that now. Anyway, hold on. My glasses are off on me. Hold on a second. I can't believe I said that. No. Uh, where were we? Um, right here. Yeah. Okay. Hold on. Let me. My glasses are a little messed up. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry for saying that to anybody that's offended with somebody mentioning a in that a, a particular body part of a man. And they don't want to hear that. I'm so sorry. Anyway, uh, Wandering Americans. Uh, first off, what am I reading? This. The, the Teen's Guide to World Domination. Uh, advice on Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Awesomeness by Josh Shipp. And yeah, that right there is his autograph because this was at a time when I was in uh, high school and uh, we did what was called summer reading for us and uh, this was one of the three books that I had that I was reading for summers for the summer the other two books I just I know for a fact were what I think they were the the other two books were tears of a tiger by Sharon M dropper I love that book for its sheer realism and Fast Food Nation. And if you've seen Zipper Size Me, I guess you could say you've already you already know what Fast Food Nation is, because that's pretty much what it is. Minus the 30-day McDonald's diet that the guy put himself through. Uh anyway, uh oh Howard Hughes, fascinating guy. I honestly don't know this man, honestly. I honestly don't know who Howard Hughes is. You might have to clue me in on that one. And, well, what was the word? It was P's. P-E-A-S. I can't believe I said that, though. No. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to go back to the, uh... I want to go back to the paragraph that I was on, okay? <clears throat> so, where were we? Oh, yes, we were talking about Howard Hughes. And because I completely don't know what I read, I, I mean, like, I read, I know what I read for, like, this little bit here, but I'm going to read the two paragraphs below it. Anyway, <clears throat> I'm actually going to read that full thing, post the steps here that I was doing there. So, we're going to start after the steps that I said here. <clears throat> Sorry, I just heard the door open, but I know who it is. But anyway, we're moving on. Treat your allies well. And don't just expect them to be there for you. Be there for them, too. Often, our allies provide more than help. As people, we actually need other people to just to keep us from going crazy. And now a lesson from history. By the time he was 30 years old in 1935, Howard Hughes was one of the richest and most famous men in the world. He built an empire producing big-budget films and dating hot actresses. Picture a cross between Steven Spielberg and Brad Pitt. That was one of the mega celebrities of his time. He did what he wanted, even if it was risky or weird. When the whims struck him to fly planes and break the airspeed records, he did it. When he wanted to fly around the world, he did it. As time wore on, though, Hughes became reclusive and began to slip into mental illness. He became obsessed with the size of peas. Not what the hell I just said earlier. 
uh, and surrounded himself with boxes of Kleenex, which he would sort over and over again in stacks. He developed an addiction to painkillers, codeine, and morphine, and fell further into madness until he was living as a complete hermit. He ordered his servants not to look at him in the eye, cut one film on a constant loop so that he watched it at 150 times, and refused to cut his fingernails or hair except once a year. Not a way to end up. Oh, my God, voice gave me a much need to laugh that piece through today. <laughs> I'm glad I could do that for you. I am so glad for that. <laughs> oh, dude, somebody's going to make a clip of that. If I want to make a short of that. I want to make people laugh at my stupidity. Uh, I want to be like, I want to make the time. I want to clip that moment later. And I'm going to be like, uh, where was it that I said you? He became obsessed with the size of what? Just <laughs> that's gonna be the title of the short. I'm guarantee. I'm telling you guys right now that is gonna be a short of me ridic doing self ridic ridicule ridicule. Okay, because that shit was fucking hilarious. But I can't believe I said that. I still can't believe I fucking said that. I mean, you can't really blame. Hold on, hold on, hold on a second. Somebody's about to open my door, and I'm about to mute so they they don't get heard. One moment, please. Da, 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 da. Come on, mute microphone. Thank. Sorry about that, family member. Anyway. <clears throat> this, okay, so we're right here. Talking about not a good way to end up. Getting back into the story now. <clears throat> Despite his wealth, his fame, his films, his aviation hijinks, and the girls he dated, Howard Hughes is remembered for being an insane recluse. Not exactly the legacy of a world-dominating hero. So what's the takeaway here? There's a famous saying. Live together, die alone. If you're serious about dominating your world, you need to stay close with your friends so you don't end up going crazy and die a sad, bitter, lonely old person. If you try to go it alone, you do so at your own risk. Chapter 15, How to Own Your Own Identity in the, war, in the war for your world, your identity is the single biggest battleground. Take this hill and everything else will be much easier. Ignore this issue, and sooner or later the villains will probably win. Trust me, I've seen this happen many times. Villainly, you are most likely to encounter ghosts, vampires, ninjas. Why is this issue so important? Because your identity lies at the core of who you are. It has everything to do with who you believe you are and what you think you're capable of. It's the truth or lie that generates or undermines your self-confidence. Your behavior will always follow your beliefs. So if your mind is dominated by ghosts telling you you're worthless, hopeless, or not good enough, your very sense of self is totally whipped. When you believe the lies, when you start accepting those labels as fact, you start to act like those lies and labels are true. And before you know it, you're sabotaging yourself. Suddenly, you become easy prey for ninjas and vampires and pirates and zombies. They own you. And they're happy to help guide your life straight down the toilet. Okay, confession time. I shouldn't even be here. This topic of identity is very, very personal for me. Most of you guys know know this, unless you skip the 
This is required reading section at the beginning of this book, in which case I owe you a slap. But I had a pretty tough childhood, which led into my teenage years, which frankly were very, very miserable at times. You see, because of my past, growing up in foster care, the abuse, the neglect, the hurt that I experienced, I allowed that to label and define me. I allowed that shape my I allowed that to shape my identity and dictate who I thought I was going to be in the future. I remember at one point this guy literally yelling at me, Josh, you're what you are a you are just a punk orphan foster kid. That's all you're ever going to be. Nothing more, nothing less. I mean, it was literally those words. I can still remember that guy saying them. And sadly, in that moment, I let those words label me. And I believed them. Yeah, you know, I am a punk orphan foster kid. And I guess that's all I'll ever, I'm ever going to be. Nothing more, nothing less. It sank in, and I believed it. And because I believed it, I acted out. I was the class clown. I was a rebel. I fought with my foster parents and got in trouble with the law. And I actually hated myself. There was a time in my life when I seriously thought about killing myself. I don't think we need to go into detail about the whole... If you feel... If you or someone you care for is having suicidal thoughts or bouts of depression... There is a su... Uh, I, I don't know, What was it? There's a phone number that you can call. It's like the Suicide Prevention Hotline, I believe it's called. Uh, but yeah, if that, if anybody is going through that, I highly recommend doing so. Because doing so could save your life or the life of someone else. I wish I knew what the phone number was and I would say it, but I honestly don't. Fact, 50% of foster kids end up in jail, dead, or homeless. And honestly, that is exactly where I was headed. But then there was this moment. A moment that seemed unbelievably insignificant at the time. I was at one of my lowest points. This is when I was 18 years old. I was dealing with depression big time and felt completely worthless. So I tried to make myself feel better by spending tons of money I didn't have using bad checks. Then spiraled out of control for or just fast and I ended up getting tossed in jail for a night. Very scary. But here's the thing. Oftentimes our moments of change are inspired by moments of absolute agony. No one changes until they face something hard, bump up against some resistance. You either get more set in your ways or are shaken up enough to say, screw it, this isn't working, I'll try something different. I think 988 is the number to all for suicide and crisis prevention. I know that there was something at my work that they put on our lockers where it was like a magnet and a little card that talked about uh, talked about that. I wish I had that card with me now because of what we're reading here. But I don't know. Where, but I don't have it. But what I'm saying is true. What I said earlier about, you know, what I said earlier in regard to if you or someone you care for is having suicide, is having bouts of suicidal thoughts or just, or depression or a mix of both, just call the, you know, just get involved with the su suicide prevention hotline because you'll be saving your own, your life and possibly, and if someone, if it's someone you care a whole hell of a lot of, a whole hell of a whole hell of a lot about, you'd be saving their life too. Even if they don't quite see it that way, for a, at first. Because I I know what it's like. I like, I know what it's like going through bouts of depression. I never had bouts of suicide, but I did have a few bouts of depression. And, uh, I don't know if I should go into detail on it myself, but I do know, I have, I have known friends 
who had bouts of depression and su and or suicide, suicidal thoughts in their head too. And I helped every single one of them. Every single one, every single person I tried to help. If I hear somebody say something that sounds like they're having suicidal or depression or like suicidal thoughts, tendencies or bouts of depression, I would say something that I hope they that they feel. But we're, while we're on that subject, for the love of God, never, ever, ever fake suicide, suicidal actions in any way, shape, or form. And I have had, my, I have seen this happen at least once, maybe twice in my life on social media. Specifically on Twitter. Because when you do that, you are taking away people, you are making it seem like the people who are actually going through this fucking bullshit, that is suicidal thoughts and depression, you make it seem like they are probably faking it too. Or that they want attention. They're just doing it for attention. One or the other. Just don't fucking do that. And I'm going to be honest with everybody here. If I see anybody, if I find out somebody is doing that shit, that motherfucker is going to be blocked. And if they're a viewer of my channel, I'm muting them. They're not going to be allowed in this chat room. Period. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Let, let me tell you something. Okay? Let, let, me, let me tell you a story. Okay? I'm not going to say the name of this person because it was a character name in reality, but I'm not going to say names, but I, and if another friend of mine is here, he will know, he would know about this. But like I said, I'm not going to name any names because it was years ago. And honestly, I want to tell you what happened, all right? First and foremost, this person that did this, the, fir the, o the first person, if not the only person I know that done this, was 13 years old at the time. Now, I gave him a chewing out. I gave him a chewing out. When I found out about it, I chewed him out. Because even at 13 years old, he had to learn not to say or do stupid things like that. What happened was, and this is where it gets weird, okay? For context, I was involved in what is known as the call community. It's a wrestling game community involving specific, mainly WWE games, where you create a character in the game, you create a persona for the character, kind of like how you see, if you're a wrestling fan, you know what I'm, what I'm talking about here. But for the non-wrestling fans, it's basically where you create a character on, these w, on this WWE game, you create a gimmick slash persona slash character for this uh, person that you're creating in the game, you create a move set to go along with what, uh, with his character, with his gimmick, persona, character, whatever, as well as his entrance, victory, you know, all that jazz, okay? And when that happens and you're part of this community and you're involved with these E federations or, uh, sim feds, E federations being where it's AI versus AI. Simfed being where it's person versus person. Alright. Uh, I'm just letting everybody know about the context of behind this. And in this situation, I was involved with one of, with an E-Fed. I'm not going to say the name of the company. Uh, because the name of the company, the company in itself had nothing, had nothing really to do with this outside of kicking him out of the group chat for what he did. Okay. Now, this kid was 13 years old at the time. 13 to 15 years old. And at one point, my character was involved in a storyline with his character. And for whatever re after that storyline ended, I don't even know where this came from. And I don't even know if it was because of the storyline with me and him. 
But for some reason, he was posting pictures of these, these, you know, the razor cuts all over the arm. He kept sending these ra these pictures of razor cuts all over, like literally, like, like, literally. That's exactly what he sent. And then once it was found out, no, 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 no. Once it was found out, he was using other pit. He wasn't doing it to himself. He he never did. He was faking the. He was. He was used. Apparently, he was using Google Images to try to get people to. I don't know, pity him or something. I don't know. But. When it was found out that he was faking this shit, literally everybody, and I mean everybody that found out, went ape shit on this kid. I was like, in my mindset, I was pissed off at him too. But I looked at it like, dude, let this be a life lesson to you. Never fake this bullshit. Because if you do it, you're going to make all the people who are actually going through this shit look bad for what you did. And so, I don't really talk, I used to talk to this kid. Like, like he, he's grown a bit older and he has kind of learned his lesson. He's kind of matured, I, I guess. I don't know, because it's been a few years since I did last talk to this, to this young man. But I hope he's learned his lesson, and I hope he's become a better person than who he was when he did this shit. I'll be surprised if he's actually here and listening to this story. I'd be very surprised. But yeah, that... Yeah, that was... That actually happened. That really real that really happened and I could if I was able to ask somebody to come up and say that well this lady pretended to be dying of kidney failure that she posed as her brother and came on and said she died and it was all fake dude just people faking injuries of any kind is bullshit I fucking I have no respect for anybody doing that case in point I'm already thinking of somebody else right now this one dude I forget his username. I actually do. But I remember hearing a few times of this man, of this story of this man who pretended to be paralyzed to the point to where he had to be in a wheelchair. And then at one point he accidentally forgot to put his camera down. So he stands up off of his rocking chair, off, not rocking chair, the wheelchair. And this woman, who I'm guessing was like his girlfriend, fiance, wife, whatever, she immediately knew what happened, and she tried to distract the people from what happened. And then while she was doing that, the dude put the camera down. I'm like, dude, that's that's like 10, 15 seconds too late. Dumbass. He could have easily convinced people that... He was par paralyzed, but because of his own stupid, because of his own stupidity, he exposed himself. And I love it when people expose themselves, because then it makes it hard, it makes it easier for us. See, when people expose themselves or they admit to their own faults, I can't. I can still be upset with what they did, but I can at least say. Well, he did, like, when it comes to that sort of thing, he's an asshole, because he never actually, because he did it on accident. But when you do it, but when you purposefully do it, it's like, well, you're still a fucking asshole, but at least you, oh, you manned up and made, accepted your mistakes, but I'm still gonna call you an asshole. And I'm saying that in a general sense, I'm not saying that to anybody in particular here. Unless a certain somebody is here, but I doubt he is, because I'm pretty sure I've made sure his he is not allowed back in here. If you know what I'm talking about from last year, then you know. If not, I'm not going into detail, because it is irrelevant to the conversation at hand. 
Oh, gee. Yeah, de faith in your own death is kind of stupid, just like every other death hoax. Anyway. <clears throat> Where were we at? Oh, yes. Oftentimes, our moments of change are inspired by moments of absolute agony. No one changes until they face something hard, bump up against some resistance. You either get more set in your ways or, be sh or are shaken up enough to say, screw it, this isn't working, I'll try something different. For me, I'd hit the bottom. And that was when my foster parents took looked me in the eye in the living room and simply just said, Josh, you are not a problem. You are an opportunity. And verily, verily I tell you, that little shift in perspective from a grown-up in my life forever shaped my identity. The funny thing is, my foster parents have probably said that to me like a gazillion times before. I'll be honest, I would often tune them out. But at that moment, I was ready to hear it. I was ready to believe it. I'm so thankful that they didn't stop telling me that. I'm so thankful that they didn't just write me off. Because everything I am today, everything that I have accomplished today, everything that I have done today, I can trace back to that one simple moment. I should have ended up homeless. Instead, I helped change the world. I'm living proof that changing your identity, changing your perception of yourself, changes everything. So, let me ask you something. Who are you? A simple question. Just three little words. But it's also a question that is a lot harder to answer than it seems. Particularly when we're young. Our identity is based on a mix of our personalities and our experiences. And the younger we are, the less our experiences have shaped us. You might feel like your personality shifts depending on where you are in life. That's okay. Discovering who you are is a lifelong process. But the earlier you get started, the better off you'll be in the end. That saying what about the early bird getting the worm? Yeah, that applies here. But with success and happiness instead of, you know, a worm. Before I get on here, we have an awesomeness tip in, the, in a speech bubble here. Awesomeness tip! If you don't figure out who you are, some villains will tell you who you are. Don't let villains dominate your world. Getting back on topic. There was this kid in my high school class, everyone called Stanky. I sat next to him in science class, so every once in a while I'd kind of sniff him. You know, take a deep breath through my nose to see how bad he smelled. Because, I mean, you gotta sting something off on him at the name Stanky, right? It was like scientific experiment for me. Because I'd write down on a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 being the stinkiest, how bad he smelled. 7.453. 8.162. You know what I discovered? At the end of my experiment, I discovered he smelled pretty good. Not bad. Like an 8. That's pretty impressive. I don't smell that good half the time. You know what else I noticed? On his papers, in the upper right hand corner, he would write that his name was Stanky. Kind of funny, right? At the time, I thought it was hilarious. But now I realize it's sad. Because you see what happened? This dude let other people define him. Tell him who he was. Worst of all, it wasn't even true. But that's how it works. If you don't figure out who you are, someone else will try to tell you who you are. My fear? If you listen to them for long enough... If you let them label you for long enough, you just might start to believe it. You just might buy into it. You just might start writing that name on your paper. Don't let your villains tell you who you are. That's lame. This is for you to decide. This is something you've got to own for yourself. It's hard though, right? Gosh, I remember when I was in junior high and high school, I had no clue who I was. 
I was kind of overweight, not very good in school, kind of a loner. But most people thought I was funny, and I kind of liked that attention. So, it was all very confusing. Maybe you know what I'm talking about. You may feel completely comfortable and outgoing with close friends. Maybe you're the joker everyone relies on for a laugh at your job, where your quick wit pours out cl clearer than natural spring water. But then at school you feel lonely and shy and no one gets your sense of humor. It may seem weird, but trust me, it's a classic situation. Everyone feels this way to some extent. Some people thrive under pressure and in new situations, and others work best when they know the boundaries and the people they're around. We all have places and situations where the solutions come more easily, where we are particularly capable. The trick is figuring all this out. Here are some basic questions to get you started on your journey of self-discovery. Settle on something here. First, what makes you unique? You know those quizzes that people are always sending around on Facebook, asking random, seemingly pointless questions like, if you were a can of soup, what flavor would you be? Or, if you were a organic field, what crop would you grow? They're kind of a waste of time, but they can also be strangely thought-provoking. Generally, the point is to get to know yourself and your friends a little better. And here's the thing about answering questions like that. You realize you're different from everybody else. Okay, maybe someone else also picked Campbell's chunky vegetable beef stew, too, but they probably did it for different reasons. Everything from your favorite color to your favorite Disney princess has something about what makes you unique. You know how your one friend always sneezes 15 times in a row, and how that one guy in history class twirls his pen through his fingers when he's bored? Those are called quirks, and they're part of what hap what makes different people different. See also, habits and patterns. Sometimes these things are harmless and fun. Sometimes they're embarrassing. Other times they're downright difficult to deal with. By picking up on the fact that you've only dated jerks, or that you tend to freak out when things don't go in court exactly according to plan, or that you have a habit of choking under pressure. Still, detecting and examining these patterns is crucial. Usually bad habits indicate that there's a ghost or a vampire or a ninja calling the shots somewhere. But until you recognize the pattern and address the cause, you'll be doomed to repeat the cycle forever and ever. And now a quick warning about vampires. Something being different, sometimes being different or unique doesn't always see it as a good thing, right? I mean, no one wants to be the weird one or the odd man out. But sometimes we're so scared of rejection because of ghosts that we feel the need to fit in by imitating or impersonating other people. Like this. You think so-and-so is cool and he thinks you're cool if you act like him, so you do act like him and feel a sense of belonging and identity. But get this. That's not your real identity. That's like turning into a robot that says the right things and does the right things just so you can be accepted by a vampire. LAME! Look, there's nothing wrong with having role models, but just because your friends are like a certain band or a clothing brand or a, or a movie doesn't mean you have, you have to. If you have to be like your friends just to be accepted by them, they're vampires. And they're probably not as cool as you think they are. Second, what do you love? What makes you happier, gets you excited? You know those times when you just want to jump up and down and punch the air and maybe shout something like, Woohoo! Pay attention to those things, activities and situations, because these are the things you love. Some of that may change over time, but a lot of it won't, so take notes. But make a list of things that make you absolutely ecstatic. Same thing goes for the stuff you don't like. The stuff that annoys you and bums you out and makes you want to tr to rend your garments and throw feces like an angry chimpanzee. Make a list of all that stuff too. Some of the bad stuff, like homework or eating vegetables, you baby. You baby. 
You'll just need to get over. Don't become a zombie. But pay close attention to the rest of stuff. Because if you can figure out what you love and build your life around it, while avoiding the things that give you heart heartache, your happiness will be genuinely limitless. Third, what are you good at? It's important to recognize when you feel strong and when you don't. When you're asked to lead a group, do you roll into the fetal position, or do you stand tall and take charge? When you're asked to write an essay on a book you like, do you poke aimlessly at the keys and hope no one actually reads it, or do you blow through it like the Olympic gold medal sprinter Usain, Usain Bolt? Whether you believe it or not, there's something you, you there's something about you that sets you apart. You are good at something. You may not be the absolute best in the world at this thing, but you're miles ahead of most people. Think about your friends and family. What makes you different from them? What skills do you have that they don't? One way to figure it out is to ask them. Your parents and friends might have a perspective on your talents you can't see. So, just ask them straight up. You'll have to get a whole stack of compliments in return. Remember though, you're not your own per- Wait, ugh. Remember though, you're your- You're your own person. Maybe your mom- Maybe your mom thinks you're the best laundry folder in the world, but that doesn't mean you want to spend your life folding clothes. So take other people's assessments of your talents with a shaker full of sea salt. One of Einstein's grade school teachers said he'd never amount to much, and people wrote me off as a lost cause when it came to communicating. Who's laughing now? In the end, you're the best judge of what makes you feel strong, capable, and fulfilled. Pursue those things. The things that frustrate you and, frustrate you and make you feel stupid and start to cry a little, push down them, push through them when you have no other choice. For me, this was, made, was math in school. But if you're given the opportunity, say in college or in your career, leave the stuff you're bad at for the people who lose it and rock at it, and stick with your strengths. What do you stand for? Let me ask you this. If you're a villain... Hey, hold on. Let me ask you this. If you had a million dollars and you had to give it away, what organization or cause would you give it to? Is there anything in the world today that makes you so sad and angry that you want to change it? I think all of us have something to say to the world. Something that no one else could say the same way. This won't necessarily be a speech or a book or a great work of art. It could be anything. It could be a kind heart or a knack of fixing cars or the ability to lead others on a sense of justice and honesty. The point is, you have something to give back. I'm not saying you need to be a politician or, Olympic a or an Olympic idol athlete. Or an, or an arena rock star. I'm saying that... I'm saying that you have to be... You! And part of being you... The part of a world-dominating hero... Is with what makes you think... What makes you unique... And what, make, and what you love and what you're good at... To make a difference... To communicate a message however you're gifted... Wherever you are. If you live the best story you can live... The best story you can live... It's bound to inspire someone else. That's the, that's the bottom line there. That's what the goal of owning your own identity really is. It's about teaching the point where we know what we want to say, and we spend our lives saying it, standing for something and working for something greater than ourselves. Sure, we'll probably stumble and fall in along the way, but we won't give up. I won't lie. I'm sure money and power and fame are great and all. You can help the powers with money and power. You can't... You can get your message put across with fame. But in the end, they're not all that important or even that impressive. What would, what would you want to do? And what would you want to say has to be bigger than those things? David Jackson was born in Cleveland... Or David Johnson was born in Cleveland, Ohio. He was the third of three children, with two older brothers and a younger sister. His family was poor. When David was two years old, his father went out to pick pizza for the family's dinner, 
but he never came back. After that, things were harder. David's mom worked full-time at Walgreens during the day, and she picked up extra shifts at a Mexican restaurant to, in the evenings. David and his brothers were forced to take care of themselves, and David watched as they began selling weed to help out. Wow, okay. When they got good at that, they moved on to selling crack and heroin. David's older brother was shot and killed during a drug bust, and his, older, and his other brother became an addict. David promised his mother he'd do better. He avoided the quick cash of he avoided the quick cash of drug dealing. He found a pastor in the neighborhood who who counseled him, and he worked and he worked hard in school. His teachers saw potential saw his potential, and he was un uncommonly good with numbers and a hard worker. Still, college was out of the question. His mother made just enough money for rent, food, and food. Well, enough money for rent and food. And David had no idea about how to go above, you know, to go sh about apply applying. Uh, but David's economics teacher felt he could easily, well, he could make him something of himself. She joined him and, uh, yeah, she, she helped him apply not only to college, but for scholarships suited for boys with his background. He was accepted as the University of Magi uh, Michigan. The scholarships held, but they weren't enough. So David worked full time when, while he was in work in school at Ann Arbor all four years ago. And despite all that, David graduated seventh in his class with a degree in business. Then he got hired at a Fortune 500 company. He worked his way into management, the upper management, and all the way up to become the company's chief financial officer. That's a big deal in the world, in the business world, FYI. He made millions and millions of dollars. He had 14 cars and silverware made of gold. He had engineers build him a house that could float in midair. The end. Based on that story, here's what we know about David. He's accomplished more than anyone could imagine. He lived an incredible story. And then when he reached the top, it stopped. Here's another end to David's story. He had he made millions and millions of dollars. He moved back to the neighborhood where he grew up and bought a modest house where he lived with his wife and children. He spoke to his old friend, the pastor, the pastor, and together they started a foundation for kids growing up without fathers. He lent money to a local to local businesses in the neighborhood. The first business was a bakery, then a baker, then a barb toad joint, then an old fashioned barbecue or bar uh, old fashioned barber shop. Where where does the barbecue come in? I don't know. The the economy in David's neighborhood planning he added on to his modest house, building a giant dining room and first rate kitchen. Uh, four nights a week. David, would we have a, would we have deal from the neighborhood over there? Hmm. Alright. Uh. Hmm. Okay, then. Hmm. Okay, let's see here. No one would have faulted David for never going back to the, to Cleveland. He could have lived in Paris or New York. In fact, that's what we expected people to find. Who I am? No one would have faulted. No one would have faulted David for never going back to Cleveland. He could have lived in Paris or New York, in fact. That's when we expect of the people who become enormous, enormously, uh, yeah, 
no, 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 I'm trying to, excuse me, sorry. No one would have fought to David for never going back to Cleveland. He could have listened in, say, in Paris or say, or New Mexico. In fact, he ex we ex that's what we expect. People who have become... Hmm. Oh yeah, this one. No one, wait. But David knew who he was. He was a... He knew where he came from and he how he'd use it. Then he'd been raised. He knew there were thousands of boys just like him who wouldn't get caught, who wouldn't get the breaks, he said. The, and the only two would end up like his brother, brothers. Polar boy makes it. Out of his mind of Ginger City, Cleveland. L.A. became the legend because of me. <clears throat> So, who are you? And why are you getting all... Why are you getting all... Yeah. So, if you don't believe you got what it takes, you're listening to ghosts. Kicks them in the month, in the mouth, not for me. Hmm. World Domination Challenge. In the back of this book, there's a short video above me. It's one of those things published male authors do, basically. Uh, soldiers who I drew in a few sentences. It's a little... Mm. Mm. Let's see here. Da -da -da -da. It basically describes who I am in a few sentence, sentences. It's a little square, square, uh, on the details, details, but it hurts most the resistance raised it to get Austin. Oh, shoot. Uh, let's see here. In the back of this book, there's a short big a short bio about me. It's one of those things publishers make authors do. It basically describes who I was, in fact, facing. Uh, yeah, uh, it's a little spare on the details, but this hit, but it hits most of the rest of the week. Uh, Oh, well, there's that. Uh, let's see here. Jeez. Uh, I'm gonna read that one more time, just so that way I know I read it all. In the back of this book, there's a short bio about me. It's one of those things publishers make authors do. It's basically, it basically describes who I am in a low fence. Hmm. Alright. <clears throat> Man, I could go for something to drink, but I'm going to finish these next three chapters. Then I will take a break, alright? Chapter 16. How to deal with your parents. Ah, parents. Like it or not, your practices are, your patients are a big part of your world. I'm sorry, but Mrs. Faye... Hmm. Hmm. Alright. <clears throat> oh, wait, where were we at? Yeah, hold on a second. I am actually going to take a little bit of a breather. Gonna get me something to drink so I can stay focused on this. But I tell you, man, we got a good amount of book to go through. But if we went through half of it yesterday, we can do it again today. But I'm gonna take a bit of a break. I will be right back. Oh. 
Oh, okay. Uh, the Wandering American. Uh, this is a great book. I'm a published writer for us. You have influenced me. Thank you. Well, I appreciate it. Well, that's... Well, you're welcome, Wandering American, if you're watching this either live or when you watch, if you're watching the VOD getting up to this point, you're welcome. And I wish you the best in that, in your published works. Hmm. So I'm going to go ahead, take a little bit of a breather, and I'll be right back. All right, spirit back.
Okay, I have returned. Sorry for that wait, guys. But I do have a bit of a drink here. From something that I had earlier. I had something to eat. Some McDonald's. So, yeah. Got my mom, my, uh, yeah, my family member got me, gave me her drink, and so now we're moving on with that story. Anyway. <clears throat> Hmm. Now, we were on chapter 16. Butcher a little, butchered a little bit of uh, the last page, that last bit of the page there of the last chapter, but it is what it is. We're moving on. Anyway, <clears throat> chapter 16. How to deal, the big one for the teenagers. How to deal with your parents. Ah, parents. Like it or not, your parents are a big part of your world. I'm sorry, but you don't have a choice in the matter. These two misfits brought you into this world without even asking your permission, and now you're stuck under that under their care. Sure, they were probably there when your bloody little head burst forth into the world for the first time. Sure, they dutifully wiped and powdered your bottom every time you pooped until you were two years old. Longer for some of you, you know who you are. Sure, they burped and bathed you. Sure, they paid for your food and shelter and clothes. Sure, they generously donated half their generic code, their genetic code to you. For some reason, after all this, they act like you owe them. I mean, come on! They chose to bring the end of the world. What did they expect? That your diapers would just change, them, change themselves? That you'd go hunt and gather and prepare yourself a balanced meal? Seriously, changing, seriously, changing diapers and feeding and bathing and clothing, it's all part of the package. That's just, that's just what happens when you, when, when you have a kid. In case you're slow, I'm employing a little something called sarcasm right now. Let's face it, your parents did put in a lot of work. Sure, sometimes having them tell you because I said so is a little irritating, but, eh, showing a little respect couldn't hurt, even when they screw up. Oh, they do screw up sometimes, but you knew that, right? Villainy you're most likely to encounter. Ghosts, robots, zombies. Right about the time we reach sixth grade or so is when we start realizing our parents aren't perfect. After that, it's dicey for a while. Let's face it, our parents aren't always easy to live with. Sure, some parents are fairly awesome, but no one is perfect. Shoot, my biological parents didn't even stick around five minutes after I was born. They just packed up and left me crying in the hospital. I mean, you think you had it, you have it bad. I had 12 different sets of foster parents to deal with growing up. 12! Think about it. I'm not trying to be a zombie here. I'm just trying to give you some perspective. I've got lots and lots of experience in the whole dealing with parents category. Parents have more impact in shaping our personality and choices than any other outside than any other outside source, which is honestly kind of frightening since we can't choose them. Even worse, and we may not want to admit this, but we are probably more similar to our parents than we think. Our families can become a breeding ground for our loudest and most destructive ghosts, telling us where we will fall short and why we shouldn't even try. You're just like them, the ghosts whisper, pointing at your parents. Not me, you're saying. I'm nothing like my parents. Don't get me wrong, the ghosts are lying. You are different. But you'd be surprised by the family resemblance. Knowing those ghosts and knowing those similarities can help you break free. The pains of parenting. Let's return to one of my basic Joshisms. Seek to understand before you seek to be understood. This is a crucial knowledge biscuit, and I'll tell you why. I became a parent recently, so I feel like I've got some insight into how this works. 
Admittedly, my son is tiny, so I haven't had to deal with neck tattoos, concealed weaponry, or learner's permits yet. Still, when you become a parent, you suddenly seem to gain some sliver of insight into why your parents act the way they do. And some of it is surprising. First, your parents want the best for you. I mean it. They love you in a way you can't know until you have your own children. I'm telling you, it never made sense until I was in their position. All of a sudden, there was this pipsqueak creature living inside my wife, swimming around her belly and punching the edges. I could feel him in there. Sometimes I'd tap and I'd feel a tap back. The tiny creature continued to get bigger until I could feel his back and his feet and his hiccups. And then, months later, London Alexander was born. He came into the world screaming, just like his dad. He was this little ball of skin and uncoordinated mu muscle, wiggling all over. He turned toward my wife and me when we spoke, and he knew, even then, that we were his parents. When my wife was pregnant, I'd think about how great it would be to be a dad. I'd think about how my son would admire me, and how I'd teach him how to do manly things, like box and talk back to authority figures. Except me, of course. I read all these books talking about how important a father is in a son's life. How a boy looks up to his father like he was Batman. The books were inspiring at first, but then I started to think about the prospect of my son becoming older. I thought about how there were all these mistakes that I knew I would inevitably make. And I worried that maybe every mistake I made would irreparably mess him up somehow. Like if I fed him first like pureed peas rather than carrots, he'd end up being a guard at a maximum security women's prison rather than a state senator. That's oddly specific, but whatever. Maybe the thing that broke my heart most was picturing him as a teenager. I knew he'll be a better teenager than I was, but if he's even one one hundredth as bad, I'm in for an ocean of hurt. I think every parent wants the best for their children. They love their children with what, with that same unexplainable love. They want their children to be healthy and happy, to follow their dreams and be successful and good. They want their child to love and respect them back, and they want to help their children become all they want to be. If you're honest, most of you will realize you have a lot, or something at least, to be thankful for. I've never met my own biological parents, but I owe my foster family my life. They were patient with me with them when everything was falling apart, and they loved me enough to help me turn things around. We all need a grown-up or two who believes in us and sees our potential. Who looks past our screw-ups and mistakes and sees us for who we could be? A hero. Possibly in a cape of some sort. For the record, mine would be magenta, simply because I like the word. I don't even know what color that is. The perfect parent does not exist. There's a flip side though. In sitcoms, a parent makes mistakes, but the episode always ends with a lesson learned and a wise word, as if every problem life throws at us can be solved within 30 minutes or during a commercial break. No parent understands fully how to bring this about. Before you were born, your parents were human. They were impatient and brash and unwise. They were quick-tempered and selfish. They made lots of mistakes, just like you. After you were born, there were still those same two selfish people. It's just now, it's just that now they had this vast cosmic quantity of love for you, often with very little grasp of how to get, let that out, how to really help you. Every parent learns over time, but it's hard work. Harder than bench pressing a cow or eating 20 chili dogs in 5 minutes. It means learning from a whole lot of mistakes and going through a whole lot of pain and conflict. Pain and conflict are a part of life. I know my son will confront ordeals I won't ever understand, but I'll tell you this. I do not want him to make the same mistakes I did. I would give my life if it meant he could avoid the situations I faced. Chances are, your parents think the same way. It's sort of a universal parent feeling. Just knowing this fact will help you in your relationship with your parents. If you treat your parents as villains, 
your life until you leave home, and probably a good chunk of your life after you leave home, will be miserable. It'll be a constant war of curfews and groundings and screaming matches. If you can see your parents' perspective, though, and treat them as allies, you're getting the best support you will ever have. Now, seeing your parents' perspective doesn't necessarily mean it'll make sense. In fact, their perspective may be absolutely insane. I got a letter once from a girl who just received a learner's permit. Her dad was taking her out driving, but he wouldn't let her put her foot on the gas, and he told her to do a U-turn when there wasn't enough space. He wouldn't let her drive more than 20 miles per hour in a 30 mile per hour zone. Apparently my dad in the state of New York does, does, don't agree on what right and wrong driving is, she said. I told her, as I'm telling you now, to look at his side of the story. It was possible her dad had been in a horrific track car accident and had a hard time trusting others behind the wheel. Or maybe he was scared to go over 20 miles per hour because he saw the movie Speed when he was in high school and it permanently scarred him. That's an old, that's an old reference, so I'll explain. Keanu Reeves is trapped on a bus that's ready to blow up if it goes under 40 miles per hour, so they can't stop, right? The bus ends up jumping a 90-foot gap in a bridge, which would have been physically impossible. Still, it's a pretty good movie and stars the young Sandra Bullock in her breakout role. Hey, I didn't say her dad's fears were rational. Most fears aren't. More likely, her father was anxious. Learning to drive is a big moment in someone's life, and the girl's father might have been remembering back to that moment. I was telling you about when he allowed his daughter for the first time, and now she's gliding a ton of metal down a narrow strip of pavement, with every larger chunks of moving steel flying by in the other direction. By understanding her dad's perspective, the girl can communicate better. If she recognizes how he feels and how big this moment is for both of them, it's more likely than not it's more likely than not that he'll ease up. If he was in a major car accident when he was younger, the girl could tell him she never wants to make that mistake and would be and would he please teach her how to drive well rather than coasting across across a parking lot. If the reason ended up being because of the movie Speed, then maybe a nice quiet drive to the nearest asylum is in order. Just saying. Help them help you. There's only one proven way to deal with your parents, and it's through communication. That doesn't mean telling your parents every single detail of what's going on in your life, yeesh. But on the other hand, doing the opposite will make things way more difficult than necessary. Case in point, I want my son to have a better life than I did, to avoid the same mistakes and to evade the horrible situations I was put in. However, my son needs to face conflict to become a great man. If I shield him from everything, he will never learn to scale the obstacles in his way because he'll be used to me bailing him out. Sometimes our parents need to be reminded of this, that life is hard, and that occasionally we need to make it on our own. At the very least, you need to be honest with your goals. Tell your parents your goals. Tell them who you want to be, then ask if they can help you get there. Basically, there are two options. Option one, communicate honestly with your parents. Respect them, while simultaneously understanding they will not always be right, and they can operate only on what you've told them. Outcome, your parents become your most valuable ally. Their default mode is wanting the best for you. They want you to avoid the mistakes they've made. They want you to succeed and be happy. Communicating well helps them understand how to best show their love and support for you. Option two, lie to your parents about where you are and who you are with. Disregard their wishes. Roll your eyes whenever they get all up in your business. Outcome, since your parents control the keys to the house and car and since they also have most of the money, they quickly become your most dangerous enemy. Constant fighting with your parents makes your life a nightmare. Soon they don't trust you to make any of your own decisions. Eventually, you are finally honest with them, tearfully admitting your affair with a 28-year-old 7-Eleven cashier on a, particular, on a particularly touching episode of Dr. Phil. They send you to one of those camps for troubled kids in Utah, where borderline psychotic former Marines yell at you to make your bed. It doesn't take Sherlock Holmes or even Harriet the Spy to deduce which option is more beneficial for everyone. Up to you, though. One day, it'll matter. I'm sorry to get all morbid and sad on you here, but recently, 
I learned a close friend's father had died of a heart attack. I encountered the man only twice, but each time it felt like I was made of one of my oldest friends. He was one of those guys and one of those people who, when everyone gets up and says nice things at his funeral, every word is true. He led youth camps and mentored kids without fathers. I, I barely knew the guy, and yet I felt like he would dismantle a mountain stone by stone if I needed him to. Now, he's gone. Way too early, if you ask me. My friend's dad was fortunate. Even though he's one of the most humble people I've met, I think he knew how much he meant to so many and how much he meant to his daughters. That's not always the case, you know. I don't know what it is in us that keeps us from telling people how much we love them and how much they mean. What I do know is we always have regrets when we lose something we love, someone we love. There's always something we wish we'd said, or a relationship we wish we mended. I say all this because, let's face it, you'll have conflict with your family. That's a fact. Your parents will drive you crazy or let you down. My hope for you is that you don't let that stuff fester too long or tear you apart and make you bitter and angry. For me, I never even met my parents. And, I'll be honest, it's taken a lot for me to try to forgive them and move on. I could sit and finish the sentence, I wish, all day long. Maybe some of you are in the same situation. You never met your dad or your mom left or died when you were young. That's hard. But don't let what you've lost keep you from loving what you've got. Man, the way that drink going down my throat made me think of that sound effect that Cell does in Dragon Ball Z. Chapter 17. How to choose good friends and avoid bad ones. The self-made individual is one of the pillars of American culture. Here in the United States, we've been taught to be self-reliant, self-reliant, tough. We've been taught we can be anything we want to be. On our own, and we just tug on our bootstraps hard enough from sea to shining sea. This land is your land, this land is my land, something like that. We are a nation, we've been told, of individuals doing individual things for individual gain. It's all a lie. Okay, it's not all a lie. Not the be anything we want to be part, that's true. It's the individual part that's a lie. Truth is, no one makes it alone. Bill Gates, LeBron James, Barack Obama, the guys who invented Google. No one achieves anything without help, especially the Google guys. I mean, there were two of them. To dominate their words, worlds, each of those people needed a countless number of friends, from people their own age to mentors showing them the way. We called them allies, remember? Don't leave home without them. We are all products of our surroundings, of our upbringing and our family, and our relationships in the cities or towns where we were raised. We are shaped by everything around us, but this does not mean we all become the same shape. Besides your family and faith, no one will shape you more than your friends. Whether it's your best friend since you were seven years old, or a new acquaintance who shares your love of The Simpsons, our friends help frame how we see the world. We need friends for companionship, for sure, but we also need them to help us achieve our goals. If our friends raise hell, we're likely to raise hell. If our friends sit quietly and watch Disney movies on Friday nights, we're likely to do the same. If a friend is honest with you, you can more easily learn from your mistakes. And since you can't choose your family, choosing your friends is one of the most important choices you'll make in your life. No pressure. Awesomeness tip, your friends equal your future. Pick them wisely. You gotta start somewhere. The first rule to having friends is, of course, making friends. Hey, don't look at me. I didn't make the rules. If you think about it, making friends seems like a ridiculously long and daunting process. Think about it. Do you remember how you met your closest friends? 
Do you remember every detail? Do you remember when you crossed the murky threshold from acquaintance to buddy to friend? Of course not. These aren't the kinds of things that, we, that are marked by signposts. The memories I have of my best friends are all snippets. A conversation here, a bonding experience there, many, many years of talking all of, about all sorts of subjects. It was never one single thing. That's one of the nice things about friends. It's never one event. I saw an interview with Paul McCartney talking about John Lennon. Paul was 15 and John was 17 when they met, and Paul remembered he didn't like John. He smelled of beer. He smelled of beer, he said, and wrinkled his British nose in distaste. Of course, if they left it there, if that was the one point they remembered, John and Paul never would have formed the most famous band in rock and roll history, the Beatles. Everybody knows the Beatles. <laughs> Making friends requires, and this is going to stun you, other people. You can find other people all sorts of places. Here are some places you might want to look for friends. <clears throat> your classes at school, your sports team, your neighborhood, clubs or other organizations you're interested in, camp, church or synagogue or mosque or temple. Here are some places you probably shouldn't look for friends. Jail, prison, juvie. During a bank robbery, particularly if, the, if it's the bank robber. Math clinics. Terrorist training camp. Now that you know who the villains are, try not to befriend them. Most common forms of villainy and friendships. Ninjas, ghosts, zombies, vampires, puppies. The key to making friends is being approachable. If you join a club, for instance, and proceed to sit in the corner with your arms crossed and a brutal thousand-yard stare on your face, you're unlikely to be approached. If you're actively flipping people off, that tends to keep people away, too. You don't need to sit there like a panting golden retriever, but you should be willing to smile politely and make eye contact. You'll hear a lot more about eye contact in this book. It's hard to explain why it's important. But it is. Introduce yourself to others by saying, Hey, and shake their hand, and shake their hand. Maybe even toss out a courteous little, nice to meet you. If you do nothing else, pay attention to the person's name. In his book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, Dale Carnegie points out that a person's name to that person is the sweetest and most important sound in any language. I'm awful at remembering names, but there, is, there are a couple of tricks to remembering. The first trick is to repeat the name back. Me. Hi, my name is Josh. Unnamed person. My name is Gary Manilow. Me, try not to laugh. Gary. Nice to meet you, Gary. The second trick is name association. The name above would be easy to remember anyway, especially if you're into soft rock ballads from the 1970s and fluffy hair. Others are harder. When you hear the name, what does it remind you of? The more vivid the reminder, the better. Here's an example. Two neighbors moved into the next door to our house. The husband's name was Landon and the wife was named Carrie. <clears throat> to me, Landon sounded vaguely like Lando Calrissian, the devious backstabber from Cloud City in the Star Wars movies. Sorry for the continued references to Star Wars, but it's a movie that most everyone has, has seen, and let's be honest, it's awesome. Carrie Fisher was the actress who played Princess Leia. So even when I forgot their name the next time I saw them, I still remembered Star Wars and I was able to figure it out from there. Just as long as I didn't refer to them as Jabba the Hutt and Chewbacca, I was fine. See? It pays to have strength strategies. How are you doing? Okay, so you have the name part down. Now it's time to ask questions. It's nice when someone wants to know about you. So a series of questions asked with genuine interest can prompt a conversation. I usually start by asking where someone is from, or what school they go to, or what line of work they're in, which is a good first question because it opens up a series of follow-ups. At that point, it's time to listen. Pay close attention and to answers because that's where you'll find your next question. Me, where do you go to high? Where do you go to school? Gary Manilow. Leland High. Me. Oh, I go to Westmont. 
I think we just played you guys in soccer. Are you involved in any sports? Gary. No, I'm more of an artist myself. Me. Cool. What kinds of art? There you go. You started the conversation. Maybe you find out he's a musician or a photographer or a writer or an actor. If you're into any of that stuff, you could talk about that. If you're not, keep asking questions. What do you do for fun? Are you planning on going to college? What would you what would you want to do with your life? The point is, asking questions opens up opportunities for more questions until you find com found common ground. Eventually your <clears throat> eventually your likely you're you're likely find you're likely eventually your I think he meant you'll likely find a topic when he said your likely find a topic you're both passionate about and the conversation will take off from there. At some point, the other person will probably start asking you questions, but don't be so eager to talk about yourself. Listening is one of the most valuable traits you can have in a friendship. Remember, seek to understand before being understood. There's another advantage to listening. People love to talk, and they love others to listen. If someone knows you listen to them, they'll love you for it. Sometimes you don't even have to do anything else but sit there and nod your head. When you're a good listener, people will go to the ends of the earth for you. It's odd, but true. Listening might be your most valuable secret weapon, and anyone can do it. Finding friends in odd places. Of course, there are times when you just don't click. That happens. Maybe you don't have much in common with the other person. I've found, though, that some of the closest friendships happen with people we never thought we'd get along with. It's like that, say it's like that saying, opposites attract. After a few good conversations, or even one, you can keep in contact. With social networking, you can find the person on Facebook or MySpace, particularly if they're a friend of a friend. Score one point for technology. My friend Jordan was in the Army, and he often talks about the close bonds he built with his fellow soldiers. The people he was stuck with were all from different backgrounds, with all different interests. When we choose our friends, we often pick people who are similar to us, but it was hard for Jordan to find people like him in the Army, so his best friends were a hospital administrator from Maryland, a computer nerd from rural Oregon, and an engineer from Indiana. Most of the time they didn't like the same movies or music, but they found common ground in a common mission and in common circumstances. You'll never guess how I met my best friend. I've known this guy since I was five, longer than anybody else in my life. How did we meet? Well, I was in a gang in kindergarten. I told you I was a gangster. And he beat me up and rubbed my face in the brass, which activated my asthma, and I went to the hospital. This was our first interaction. Now we're best friends. Kill figure. I'm not suggesting you beat someone up and activate their asthma and then ask them to hang out. I'm saying sometimes we find friends when we least expect it. We can see a movie with anyone, really. They can laugh with strangers. But friends are there for moments that are tough and challenging. That space you let, to f you let few people into. And that's what friends are for. You might meet those sorts of friends at your work or in school, but the friends we least expect to make can end up being our closest allies. Funny how that works out. And now, a word from your mother. Don't take candy from strangers. No one how to meet people and strike up a conversation is all well and good, but you shouldn't just make friends with anyone who will have you. The kindly man offering you a Butterfinger and a ride home in his unmarked van probably doesn't own a candy shop. And that group that gets together on Tuesday nights to spray paint profane words on public buildings probably isn't role model material. A lot of people who seem friendly and accepting at first eventually turn out to be villains. Remember, villains don't often announce themselves and their evil intentions. Even pirates know how to turn up the charm to disarm a careless sucker looking for a friend or somewhere to belong. But they don't really care about you. They care about what they can get from you. They'll win you over. Then slit your throat and pick your pockets. Ninjas are the same way. Puppies will distract you and take up all your time. Zombies will bring you down. And vampires, 
of anyone as they are, will drain you of your identity and enslave you. Villains love the insecure. Insecure people are desperate for friends and generally fall in with the proverbial wrong crowd before they know what's happened. Or this might be you, turn around and face your ghosts. The lies you believe that make you feel inferior or unlovable or unwanted or like somehow you deserve to be taken advantage of. These lies need to be taken outside, beaten, and replaced with the truth about you. You are a hero. You have a story to tell, and no one has the right to dominate your world. This brings me to a phrase you may have heard me say before. Your friends equal your future. Want to see the kind of person you'll become over the next few years? Then take a good hard look at your friends. If they're serious about dominating their worlds and reaching their goals, they're going to help you do the same. If they're dropping out of school to deal drugs or overindulging on Cheetos, it's going to rub off on you, the bad habits of the sticky orange stuff. Like it or not, your friends have a huge influence on you. Not too long ago, MTV calls me up and invites me to be a coach on the episode of Made. Originally, I said no. They wanted to film in December and January, and I always take off those months and hang out at my house and surf. And watch lots of cartoons and late night infomercials about kitchen knives. Important stuff. Then they told me about the girl I'd be coaching. Her name is Dominique. She's a foster kid like you. She had a wonderful relationship with her foster mom. And this year her foster mom died. Since then she's been in a downward spiral of bad behavior. She's been kicked out of her school several times. And kicked out of juvie several times and gets drunk a lot and gets into fights. She's a really cool kid who just needs someone to help her turn her life around. Damn you! Why'd you have to pull the foster kid card on me? All right, fine. I'll do it. Where does she live? Pittsburgh. Crap. It's cold there in Pittsburgh. But I want to do it. I want to try to help this girl. I'm stoked. I fly, I fly out. I get to the hotel. And I get a text message from the producer. Don't unpack. Bad news. He called me to give the de he called me to give me the details. Dominique got out of juvie a day early on good behavior. But her friends took her out, got her drunk, and got her in a fight. And just like that, she was back in juvie for another month. We couldn't film the episode. She threw away her opportunity. I was so bummed, sad, frustrated, concerned. How the crap could her supposed friends take her out and get her drunk the night she gets out of juvie? Really? Really? I mean, really? You really thought that was a good idea? And therein lies the issue. So many of us want to change things about ourselves but what we are currently doing is just plain easier. It's more comfortable to stay in a rut. We know what to expect. It takes less effort. Sometimes when we, when we are trying to better ourselves, we have to distance ourselves from our old friends, old habits, old patterns. It's ignorant to think we can stand up to their peer pressure when time and time again, we've proven to ourselves that we can't. If your friends aren't helping you and you're not really helping them, what are you doing? Just messing around? Holding each other back? Dominique was one step away from turning her life around and choosing to dominate her world. And she threw that chance away because of her pirate's ninja frenemies. They blew it for her, and she let them. Don't let that happen to you. Best friends forever. As you get to know someone, it's important to watch that person's character and to treat your new friend the way you'd want to be treated. Follow rule number two. Be reliable and be loyal. Stick with your friends even if they let you down on occasion. Everybody stumbles now and then. Show grace and forgiveness. Be trustworthy and honest. And here's the kicker. You should expect the same things. If you open up about your shortcomings, your friends will appreciate your honesty and the fact you trust them. Friendships develop at all speeds, 
so don't rush things. Some people are more quiet and introspective than others. It'll take a while to open up. There's more to character than determining if someone is a good friend. Like I said before, your friends become one of your most important choices. <coughs> Excuse me on that one, sorry. A good friend can become your most powerful ally, and a bad friend can take you down all kinds of dangerous roads. It's harder to say no to our friends than to strangers, especially if there's a long history there. If your new friend becomes controlling or overly needy, or tries to coax you into shifty behavior that you don't feel comfortable with, it's time to take a break and reassess your friendship. If your friends start acting like villains, call them out. Actions, not words, are what matter. A friend may tell you she's always there, that she stashes your secrets in a locked vault, that she'd drive into a pit of molten lava or swallow a hundred habanero peppers for you. But if you find out the person you've confided in is sharing your secrets with everyone she meets, she's a ninja, and you might not be as close or valued as you thought. Stay sweet. Don't ever change. Maybe the most important aspect of making friends is having conf confidence in who you are and what you believe. This comes back to in identity and being confident and secure in who you are. See chapter 15. If, you've changed, if you're changing yourself to fit in, stop. I mean it. Sure, every friendship requires sacrifice, but if you find yourself behaving differently or compromising your convictions, things will get weird. Remember, you're dominating your own world here, and you have no need for vampires, ninjas, or zombies. There's nothing worth. There's nothing wrong with following when follow when following is called for, or listening to other perspectives, aka getting advice. But if you're just blindly stumbling along in search of acceptance, others will see that, and you won't earn their respect. You'll get used. Besides, a true friend won't end their friendship simply because you think or act differently. You might get teased or mocked on the surface, but in truth, your friends will respect you more. Be a friend. The easiest way to get others on your side is to treat them with kindness. This even works with people who aren't kind to you. Maybe they treat you like crap, but if you respond with kindness, eventually they'll either give up or turn around and be your friend. Even Kobe Bryant figured this out, and he won an NBA championship after realizing he needed the players around him. Contrary to what the old saying says, Experience shows that nice guys don't finish last. Realize you don't know everything. Old people are always going on about how the more they know, the more they realize they don't know. It can get annoying, I know. There's an important lesson here, though. When we understand our limitations and what we don't know, it frees us to seek the support of others. It makes us less arrogant and more, like, and more likable Listening to an underrated skill and, in the, and absorbing the wisdom of others protects us from making some of the same mistakes. Making mistakes is part of any process, to be sure, but if you're familiar with the experience of others, you'll be on your toes and prepared for what's coming and the mistakes won't morph into disasters. Learning from the experiences of others gives you a mental edge. Allies, honesty, and the necessity of conflict. It is not always easy to accept, but the most valuable friends we have are the ones who call us out, who are willing to stand up to us when we are wrong. They are the heroes strong enough to face us when we're acting like a villain or a fool. In our lives, it is conflict, not success or reward, that helps us become better. When we surround ourselves with allies who understand this, and have the courage to speak up when we are out of line, we are better off than if we had a hundred yes-men. A true friend doesn't just criticize, though. A true friend helps to show us the error of our ways, but also reaches down to pull us out of the holes we did for ourselves and encourages us to overcome whatever obstacles we face. True friends don't compete against us. They journey with us. Hmm. 
Chapter 18. How to Dominate the Dating Scene You want to find the perfect guy and the perfect girl and be generally well-liked by the opposite sex? First, forget what you've been told. Most common forms of villainy in relationships. Pirates, puppies, ghosts. Dating is like Cambodia. It's littered with landmines and there are a lot of poisonous bugs and snakes, but it's also beautiful and you'll have experiences you've never imagined. Maybe that's a weird analogy. The point is, our dating relationships are marked with towering highs and devastating lows. Falling in love can teach us, in, can teach us incredible lessons in kindness, empathy, love, and putting others above ourselves. Relationships can also expose our dark sides. Jealousy, anger, and envy. I don't mean to make dating sound so severe, but it often seems so fun and frivolous that we forget the pain of heartbreak or the hard work a healthy relationship takes. Okay, not to get all men from Mars, women are, men are from Mars, women are from Venus on you, but the way men and women approach relationships is vastly different. Because of that gap, I'm going to separate this chapter into two distinct parts. Girls... I think you'll start, you'll still learn a lot from reading the guys part. And guys, you'll definitely want to tune in what I'm going to say to the girls. So no skipping through parts of the chapter, you hear me? Ordinarily, I'd say ladies first, but I think the guys really need a good talking to. So we'll start with the gentlemen. Dating advice for dudes. There's this guy who goes by the name Mystery. His, new, his real name is Eric von Markovic. Mystery wears feather boas and shiny clothes, and he sometimes wears a cowboy hat, and for reasons he explains, aviator goggles. Mystery has a show on VH1 called The Pickup Artist, where he and a greasy looking buddy teach nerdy guys how to pick up ladies. He spent a significant portion of his life learning how to get women to sleep with him, and he probably deserves a swift kick to the pants. He is also really, really proud of himself. Feel free to shudder here. Whatever you want to say about mystery, what he does works. He'll walk into a bar, or a grocery store, or a laundromat, and walk out with a woman. What mystery has learned and what he teaches the weirdos on his reality show is how to fake his way into the counting process, into the courting process. Instead of confidence, mystery coaches insecure guys on how to feign cockiness. Instead of a genuine sense of humor and wit, Mystery advocates a series of pre-rehearsed lines to alternate, alternative, to alternately tear a woman down and then build her back up. Instead of advocating a powerful sense of unique self, Mystery instructs his chargers to wear crazy clothes in order to help spark conversation. In essence, Mystery has been a highly proficient in maintaining what a man should be. This is why it always seems the best girls only date jerks. Jerks, for all their inherent jerkliness, also display a convincing outward show of power and confidence. Pirates are often willing to go to the most extravagant lengths to win the best girls, but they're just after her booty. Literally. They charm, they pillage, they disappear, and they leave the best girls in ruins. Chances are, when it comes to girls, you look for certain things. Sure, you want to date someone who's funny, intelligent, and laughs at your jokes. But if you're honest, you also want to date someone who's hot. There's nothing wrong with that. I don't know why we're wired that way, but that's how it is. But here's the thing. Girls don't operate the same way. They care about physical appearance, sure. They want you to smell decent and have cool shoes. What they really want, though, is a guy who is confident, who knows himself. They want someone who makes them laugh. If that guy looks like Robert Pattinson or Johnny Depp, all the better. But truth be told, it's far from essential. Guys, on the other hand, are far more willing to ignore single-digit SAT scores and a bland sense of humor, at least to some extent, for a pretty face. Girls are not. If you are a boring, mopey oaf, you're dead in the water even if your hair looks good. It's important to realize this for one simple, spectacular reason. No girl is out of your lead. Allow me to repeat that. 
No girl is out of your league. Got it? You might want to read that sentence out loud to ensure that it sinks in. Now, I'm not saying that every... Hold on, we gotta do this awesomeness tip right here. Awesomeness tip! Be the kind of person your ideal girlfriend or boyfriend would want to be with. There's no point looking for the perfect someone if that someone wouldn't even ever be looking for someone like you. Now, I'm not saying that every girl is going to like you, but you'd be surprised. Any girl worth their salt isn't going to care if you have a six-pack and are the captain of a lacrosse team. She's going to like you if you're confident, interesting, and have good character. I have a friend in high school who never dated. He had crushes on girls, but he was deathly afraid of rejection. It's hard to blame him. Rejection is painful. There's nothing quite so terrifying as telling someone you like her, only to get, her heart, your, only to get your heart stopped by the dreaded, I just see you as a friend. Years later, through Facebook and mutual friends, my friend found out the three girls he'd been the most interested in in high school would have dated him in a gnome's heartbeat. That's faster than a regular heartbeat because gnomes are small. Because of my friend's fear of rejection, he missed three chances at getting to know those girls more. Wearing navigator goggles will not get you a girlfriend. Wearing body sprays that reek of cedar chips and rhino musk will not get you a girlfriend. Driving a Porsche will not get you a girlfriend. Dressing in flashy shirts, spiking your hair, and tanning until you're peanut colored will not get you a girlfriend. Well, it might, but not the kind of girl you're going to like being around in another month. Here's what will get you a girlfriend. Be confident in yourself. If you carry yourself with self-assurance, girls will look at you instantly and think, there's something different about that guy. Self-assurance is not cockiness. It doesn't mean bragging about who how awesome you are or how many one-armed push-ups you can do with a small child balanced on your back. It means having a strong character and being certain of who you are. It comes back to your sense of identity, to being the hero that dominates his own world. We all have self-doubts at times, but true confidence overshadows that. Be interesting and interested. Let your sense of humor show. Be quick-witted. If a girl teases you playfully, tease her playfully back, then you should never be outright mean or rude. Again, the key word here is confidence. The more you know about a wide range of topics, the easier you can converse. Even more important, listen. Ask questions and pay attention to the answers. Treat them like they're more important than you, because that's, that's what heroes do put others before themselves. Be clean. You don't need to smell like cheap aftershave and wear the finest loafers made or of imported rabbit skin, but you should at least be presentable. Wear the wear clothes that fit your frame and for Pete's sake, wear deodorant. Don't be that dude with a 10 foot radius of empty space around him at all times because he's too clueless to keep his pits odor free. Shave. Call me superficial, but the only woman I met who was into wispy mustaches had a wispy mustache herself, and that's just plain creepy. Brush. Floss. Nothing is less attractive than a dude with horrible breath. Put yourself out there. If you want to make a friend or a stranger a girlfriend, you have to be willing to take risks. Don't give way to fear. Fear is the mind killer. It's up to you to analyze that risk, though. When a girl is interested, she gives off signals. When you're young, these signals aren't much harder to see, but they're there. My friend who had those three crushes in high school could never figure out why one of the girls always sat incredibly close to him or put her hand on his arm when she laughed. He figured she just didn't know about personal space. The takeaway lesson, if a girl laughs at your jokes, looks at you a little too often, or finds excuses to physically touch you a lot, there's a very good chance she's into you. If she plays with her hair, same thing. If she actively tries to kiss your neck, that's probably a sign too, though it's an oddly aggressive one. Sometimes you gotta be the one to make the first move, and again, be confident about it. Don't just look around. Sneak glances at her, 
and dance around the issue in conversation. You'll probably just creep her out. Don't be a stalker. Be a man. Be a man of character. This one may not show instant results, but it's the most important thing you can do. If you make promise, if you make a promise, keep it. If you say you're going to be somewhere, be there. Be someone your girlfriend or prospective girlfriend can rely on. Don't be a flake. Don't let her walk all over you. Treat her with honor. When you make mistakes, own up to them. It may seem like it takes too much work, but trust me, it will work out in the long run. Not every girl will get it. Let's say you do all these things and you treat a girl great and she's still just as little you. Then it's time to then it's time to move on. Not every girl you meet is going to be ready for a healthy relationship, no matter how hard you try. Some girls sadly want to date jerks. They've got ghosts to deal with. Let them fight those battles. Regardless of what romantic comedies say, you can't force someone into liking you. All you can do is hope she doesn't get hurt too bad, and maybe it can work out someday. Sorry, but she's a classic puppy dog. Even the cutest, funnest girl in the world may be more trouble than she's worth, at least for now. It may be painful, and it may go against everything your hormones are screaming at you, but it's time to move on. You've got better things to do. Sayonara, puppy. Dating advice for the ladies. Oh, jeez, this is a bit of a long chapter. Jeez, man. What did I get myself into? <laughs> dating advice for the ladies. The best advice on dating I have ever heard from women was from a college professor named Randy Pon Posh. Randy was dying from cancer when he gave his last lecture. One of the most inspirational speeches I've ever heard. You should check it out online or buy the book. Seriously, you'll be blown away. Randy's advice to his daughter, who was two years old at the time, bo bottled em boiled everything down into one sentence. When men are romantically interested in you, it's really simple. Just ignore everything they say and only pay attention to what they do. That's it. That's all. If you follow that advice, you'll literally never be fooled. Actions define a person, not words. Think about it. If a guy tells you he's funny, but never makes you laugh, is he actually funny? Right. So, why would it be any different when it comes to love? It doesn't matter if a guy says he loves you. If he's catching make-out sessions with 15 other girls, it's not true. If he's treating you like crap, it's not true. If he's rude and never calls, it's not true. If he's mentally or physically abusing, if he is mentally or physically abusing you, he does not love you. Sorry. The truth hurts sometimes. That's not to say guys don't make mistakes and don't deserve forgiveness. Guys naturally tend to make a lot of mistakes. We're clumsy, clueless creatures half the time. And to make things worse, we can't read your minds. But when the mistakes keep happening, it's time to get out. It doesn't matter what you think about yourself. No one deserves to be treated poorly. If you think you somehow deserve to be treated badly, you are wrong. The ghosts are lying to you, and the pirates in your life need to walk the plank. It's not always easy to tell if you're dating a vampire, or a puppy, or a ninja, so you might need a clear, a clearer perspective. Find someone else, someone you trust and look up to, preferably someone who doesn't know your significant other that well, and talk to them about what's going on. If that person hears all the pulses and menaces min, mis, mis, about your boyfriend and tells you to run, do yourself a favor. Run. By the way, cheaters never prosper. And by that I mean, if a guy is cheating on his girlfriend with you, 
A, it is very likely he will cheat on you. He may treat you all nice now, but he's a scumbag. He doesn't have a moral backbone. He doesn't know how to commit and be faithful. He's a villain. And B, what the heck are you doing making out with some other girl's boyfriend, you backstabbing ninja? Sorry, that was harder than I intended. But seriously, stop it. You're embarrassing yourself and hurting other people and definitely breaking rule number two. Back to cheaters. If a guy has cheated on you once, it is very likely he will do it again. Think of it as the opposite of our legal system. A cheater is guilty until proven innocent. That doesn't mean a cheater can't change, but be very, very wary. Remember, actions speak louder than words here. Don't defend him as a really great guy until he's proved he actually is a really great guy. Hold out for a hero. Don't just settle for the first guy to take interest in you. I know sometimes good girls like you worry that you'll get overlooked somehow. That the prettier, easier vampire girls will seduce all the good guys and ruin them forever. And you don't hurry up and date somebody, anybody, you'll end up alone. Like, forever. Don't worry. It's like I told the guys. In the end, it's character that counts. Scoring dates and developing the character required for a long-term, committed relationship are completely different skill sets. That said, let's say you're interested in a guy, but you don't know if he's interested in you. For 30 days, put yourself on his radar. Talk to him at school. Chat with him online. Drop him a super casual message on Facebook or MySpace. If you have mutual friends, try and find situations where you can hang out in groups. If he doesn't ask you out or state he has interest in those 30 days, move on. It's possible he's not interested, but it's also possible he doesn't have the courage. If it's the former, you won't have to suffer the embarrassment of being turned down. Call me old-fashioned, but I think I should take the majority of the risks in these situations. If he doesn't have the guts to ask you out, then maybe it'll happen later. Either way... You've done your part. No matter what, do not change yourself to get a guy that like, to like you. That's a ninja vampire thing to do, and often, you'll just end up playing into the hands of a pirate. It's okay to take interest in his interests, but any man who doesn't like you for who you are doesn't deserve your time. You should always expect to be treated well, but the best way to assure that is to be yourself. If a guy can't handle that, move on. <clears throat> Alright, now let's bring everyone back together for a few Cohen thoughts. No canoodling! You there in the back, stop whispering. I'm about to drop some knowledge bombs. <clears throat> On sex. As a married man with a beautiful wife, let me tell you, there are a few things in life better than sex. Anyone who tells you otherwise is a lunatic or at least has some very serious issues, in which case you should not call them a lunatic. That's insensitive and potentially dangerous to your health. Uh, note, if you're reading this and you're like, Sex? <laughs> Josh uses such silly words. I wonder what it means. This is one of those times when it's probably best to not ask Google. Put this book down, go find your parents, and ask them to explain it. It'll probably make them really uncomfortable, but too bad. It's about time that you learned, you heard it from them. It beats me why people try to keep sex such a secret. Okay, back to our regularly scheduled programming. I say sex is great, and it is. But here's the thing. Sex is just one part of life. It isn't life itself. A lot of the vampires out there today would have you believe that sex is the whole part of life, and that life revolves around when you have sex, and how often, and with whom. That's crazy. Let me put it this way. If you're having a crappy week and everything in your life feels like it's falling apart and you have, an, and you have amazing sex, that doesn't change the fact that you've had a crappy week. All your other problems don't just go away. And if you're having a great week and everything's going just perfect and you have, and you have lame sex, sorry to break your heart, kids, it happens, that's not going to ruin your week. What I'm saying is this. In the grand scheme of things, sex is probably overrated. 
Having sex won't make you a man or turn you into an Angelina Jolie grade seductress or make you more mature or magically fix your self-esteem issues. It just won't. They've, this probably sounds crazy to you, and I don't blame you. If I tried telling that to 7th grade me, I would have laughed in my own face. Sex was pretty much one of the only things the boys I knew talked about in 7th seventh, seventh grade. And you better believe I was interested. You see, in 7th grade, I joined band. I played the trombone. Mostly because I liked the idea of being able to spin on the floor and have that be okay. I got pretty good and became first first chair. And from my scene in that first chair, I was in absolute prime position for starting at, staring at Christina. If I squinted my eyes just right in feigned concentration, I could stare at Christina where she sat playing the clarinet for what seemed like entities at, at a time, and no one could tell. She was a year older than me, and she was hot. Something welled up in me, something I hadn't felt before. I longed to tell her everything about me, all about who I was and wanted to be. I wanted to tell her the mystery of my mother, the tragedy of my grandfather's death, the aroma of sweet barbecue mingling with dust during an evening watermelon festival, maybe even the emptiness of a foster home where your chef Chief value is the monthly check your pres your presence brings. I wanted to tell her all a bit because I knew somehow that if I could bring myself to do it, and if she'd let me, she would know from the witness of my eyes that it was true and that we were meant to be together forever. I knew I couldn't say all that. I had never spoken to Christina aside from the customary hi when we'd awkwardly approach the band room at the same time. And one of us had to go in first. Of course... I'd let her go in first, but I daydreamed a lot. When I wasn't, <clears throat> when I wasn't in class, I sometimes gathered in the halls with other seventh grade boys who always talked about their sexual exploits. Never mind that the seventh graders at my school didn't have exploits. Only a couple of them had kissed a girl for real. I bet outside of a game of spin the bottle. I didn't stop them from talking though. Sure, I ha I've had sex. One would say, I've gotten some, I've gotten some, like a dozen times. No, you haven't. Yes, I did. With who? You don't know, you don't know her. She's really hot, though. I went to camp with her this summer. The others were skeptical. What's her name? He would give a name. He would, he would give a name. She's a year older than us. The year older, the year older detail is important. Say that you'd hooked up with a sixth grader, one point. A seventh grader, two points. An eighth grader, that was like a hundred points. I think I might know who you're talking about. No, no, not her. Another girl. Another one from camp. Who then? Oh, I don't know her last name. You had sex with a girl and you don't know her last name? <laughs> yeah, right, you're full of it. The boy would insist he was telling the truth and that the rest of us would call him a liar. The more details a boy could provide for his story, the more credible it was. And if no one could catch him in a lie, he gained the ultimate badge of authority. The right to give everyone else advice on how to get girls. Finally, one day it became my turn and I was completely unprepared. What about you, Josh? One of the boys asked. You're not a virgin, are you? <clears throat> I had never even kissed a girl. Couldn't even remember if I'd ever hold hands, tell the truth. But I couldn't tell these guys. All the social capital I had earned through a whole semester of cracking jokes and playing pranks would be lost forever. Of course I'm not, I snorted. I just don't have to brag about it like you guys. My hope was that my confidence would convince them to change the subject or at least turn their attention to someone else, but no luck. They didn't seem willing to believe me, but that just made them hungrier for details. The boys instinct instinctively huddled in closer. Who was it? One asked. This girl, I said, my mind racing. In my band class. She's an eighth grader. Pretty hot. Nice bod. All the boys froze as if reviewing my band roster in their heads. Uh-oh. How could they know who was in band? 
I suddenly remembered one of them had an older brother who played oboe. And there were few enough girls in my middle school with developed bodies that they actually had a shot at picking her out from my description. I started to regret my lie. Blonde or brunette? Oh, jeez. Blonde or brunette? Brunette. What's her name? I decided to give up. Look, I'm not going to tell you her name. She came over to my house, we hooked up, we did it. That's all I'm going to say. The boys started calling, started to call me out for lying when one of them looked across at me with a grin. I know who it is, he said. No, you don't. Yes, I do. The others hushed. There's only three hot eighth graders in grade... There are, there's only three hot eighth grade girls in the band, and only one of them's a brunette, dude. He was right. Of course it was right. That's part of the reason I stared at her all the time, and none of the other girls in the room. You got some from Christina? Oh, man, how did you do that? I was caught in the lie, completely busted, so I kept digging. I made up a story about how I invited Christina back to my place. Nobody was home. She, uh, did, I'm just gonna, st before we get into this, I'm just going to say, never lie about shit like this. I'm pretty sure he's going to say the same thing, but I'm just saying it in advance in case he doesn't. But I'm pretty sure he will. Don't ever do this. I kept digging. I made up a story about how I invited Christina back to my place. Nobody was home. She let me take her shirt off. I felt her up and we had sex. I felt... And we had sex. I filled in details where I could, which wasn't enough to, because I had no idea what I was talking about. Mostly I regurgitated little bits of stories I'd heard from other boys. I made the promise not to tell anyone and then gave us all a vote. Obviously, I didn't understand how a rumor mill works. Within two days, I was in trouble. Are you Josh Ship? Four large eighth graders waited for me as I came in from lunch. They looked unhappy and as I naive as I was. I couldn't imagine why. I didn't know these guys at all and had no idea why they were invading my personal space like this. Yeah, I said. Did you tell people you had sex with Christina? I panicked then when the ring leader said her name. No, I offered, but I might as well have said yes. Terror painted the guilt on my face. Dude, you're dead, he hissed, poking a finger into my chest. Christina's a good friend of mine. She's a cool girl. After band class, dude. After band class. As soon as we see you, you are so dead. Don't even try to run. He shoved me and they stalked past, stalked away, glaring at me over their shoulders. I felt sick. He was right. There was no point in running. Those guys were big, looked like they were in the lifting weights already, and could certainly catch me even faster than they could beat the snot out of me. I thought about letting them beat me up, but couldn't stand the thought of the four of them working me over and humiliating me in front of the whole school Again, and telling everyone why they did it. I'd go home like that, and I'd have to tell Grandma that I lied. Lied about somebody else and got beaten up for it. She'd be so disappointed. Maybe she'd think I finally got what I deserved for telling lies about people. No, I couldn't let them beat me up. Could I talk my way out of it? Only by going to Christina and hope she would call them off. Fat chance. Heck, maybe she would jump in and help them. I told people I had sex with her. She must have known by then if those guys knew, and she must have hated me. How could I ever look her in the face again, much less ask her for protection? What kind of a sissy would do that anyway? That just left me, that just left one option. They said as soon as they see me, I'm so dead. I had to make sure they'd never see me. 
so I never went to sixth period band class again. Instead, each day, I waited until the moment before the sixth period bell rang and ducked into the boys' bathroom near the back of the school and hid in the stall. I waited for about ten minutes, then after checking that the coast was clear, I ran for the outside door. There were fifty yards of open playground field where someone might see me, so I had to run hard and make it for concrete drainage ditch that provided cover while I stole, stole toward home. Those vengeful eighth graders never beat me up, but the regret did. That stupid lie ruined seventh grade, and I told that lie to try to fit in with the vampires and their empty promises. Let me be straight with you. If you spend your life trying to get girls or lie about getting girls like me to make yourself feel better when you dress sexy and flirt with guys to fit in or be popular, you're going to end up disappointed. You're chasing a lie. You also play with a puppy. I'm willing to bet you're nowhere near ready to purchase. Whether you want to admit it or not, sex comes with a serious emotional impact. There's no such thing as no strings attached sexual contact, no matter what anyone says. Sometimes you might think you've gotten away with something, because it's possible you won't feel the impact or notice any consequences right away. But trust me, you will. And even worse, the other person is often hurt too. So don't be a pirate, okay? I still remember getting the sex talk. Gary had come over to take me grocery shopping, and then we'd cook at his place. Gary wasn't related to me or anything, but he was basically like my grown-up older brother. Good guy. One of the few, one of the first guys in my life who made me feel like I mattered, you know? As I ran to my room to get ready, he and Grandma spoke in hushed tones in the kitchen. I suspected nothing. At the grocery store, we walked the aisles as we had several times before, and I cracked jokes about strange foods and brand names, expecting him to join in. Gary was oddly silent, though. It was as if he were sure he had forgotten something and was trying to recall what it was, or perhaps he had a bad day at work. We hauled the bags out to his car, which we called the Green Tank, and put them in the trunk. When we climbed in the front seats, he didn't start the car. I could hear Gary's breathing before he turned to me. It paused, then started again. Now, Jamie... Your grandma wants us, wanted us to have a kind of conversation about something I may need to kind of inform you of. Now, do you know, I mean, um, well, as Gary fumbled his for words, I realized what was happening. Oh, for Pete's sake, he is going to have the sex talk with me. I stiffened hoping it would come some, it could somehow just be over. I had figured I would escape the sex talks other kids endured because I couldn't imagine my grandma could get through it without fainting. I knew the basics about sex, a man and a woman and all the anatomy involved. Of course, there was more I wanted to know, but I couldn't imagine asking, probably because the mere mention of sex made adults stutter and turn ghostly white. Now, when a man and a woman love each other, are you familiar with the term making love? I nodded my head in no particular direction, crosswise maybe, as if to say, I acknowledge what you say, but I'm not going to answer. It's a good idea to wait. You want to make sure it's serious. The relationship. That you're ready, he said. I waited for a long time, and there's nothing wrong with that. This I hadn't heard before, and if I got one valuable thing from the talk, this was it. In my conversations with the boys at school, sex was always rite of passage, a badge of honor, a milestone to be achieved as soon as possible, like R-rated movies and driving. If Gary waited, I could wait and feel okay about it. I would still have to lie to the guys, of course, but I could feel secure within myself. And that, my friends, is the key. A lot of people have, re have sex because they're insecure. Worst reason Ever. Sex is the cutest puppy at the pound. But do not, let me repeat and emphasize that, do not enter a sexual relationship lightly. I'm not going to go on and on about your sexuality being a precious lily white flower. 
but I can assure you most of us enter into our sexual lives without fully understanding the ramifications. Speaking of the ramifications, did you know sex can lead to pregnancy and that pregnancy leads to babies? Coincidence? And even if you don't end up birthing a baby from fooling around, you'll likely birth a billion ghosts. General rule, do not compromise your beliefs on sex to make someone else happy. If a guy or girl is going to break up with you because you won't go as far as they like, beat them to the punch and break up with them. They're acting like a bounty-hungry pirate and manipulating you like a ninja. Ditch the relationship that ship is going down anyway. Compromising your beliefs will only lead to pain. To pain. I'm sure you know this, but if you do choose to enter into a sexual relationship, use protection. Pregnancies happen. Disease is more common than you think. Some studies claim teenagers 15 to 19 years old account for 41% of the 18.9 million cases of the sexually transmitted infectious diagnosed every year. If that doesn't give you the willies, nothing will. Your sex ed teacher or a doctor can detail the best methods for avoiding pregnancy and STDs, but not having sex. What fans of big words call abstinence is the only 100% guaranteed way to stay healthy and unlocked up. Just saying. Oh, here we go. Here we go. On pornography. Let's, I can't imagine being a teenage boy these days. Every teenage boy throughout history of time has dealt with rampaging hormones and moments of unrestrained lust. It's a fact of adolescence. Just, just be thankful that if you didn't grow up in some tribal village with only a loincloth to cover your sensitive regions. These days, there's a lot more sem, 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 semi-nude cave babes messing with your mind. Sexual imagery has never been more prevalent in advertising and entertainment than it is today. For proof of this, just try and go a single day without being confronted by 10 examples of sex being used to sell products. I'd be surprised if you made it to 3 p.m. without going over the limit. Now, pornography is a different matter. Side note, why does pornography sound like a science? Hmm. No one in history has ne had nearly the level of access to sexual pictures and video that you do. And contrary to what you might believe, that's nothing to celebrate. Whatever you think about pornography, there's one thing I know from my experience. It does not help when it comes to real relationships. In fact, it hurts. A lot. Pornography creates totally false expectations about what sex is. You know the saying about comparing apples and oranges? That applies to pornography and actual sex too. There's just no comparing the two. Pornography objectifies and cheapens an act that is as that is important and private, and it objectifies men and women. Plus, it creates a ridiculously erroneous impression of what the human body should be. Newsflash, not every woman has breasts the size of regulation basketballs. Not every man has a penis the length of a baseball bat, and if I can be frank for a moment, that's a good thing. Here's a warning though, porn can be addictive. Like anything that provides a cheap thrill. Doritos, multiple shots of espresso within a short span of time. It wears off quickly and leaves you with a mental, physical hangover. I know the temptations, but if you ask me, you're best off keeping as far away from pornography as you can. Porn is for pirates. It's sad, lonely people without any self-control or dignity. On breaking up. It's a fact of life. Some relationships don't work. All relationships take effort and change and they all demand that you become a better person. You can't give up every time you hit a mere, a minor bump, road bump or get sad, but there are also times when it's clear a relationship isn't going to work. If this is the case, it's time to cut your losses and step away. No one ever said it was easy, but you'll be glad when you look back and see how a small, honest expenditure of pain prevented a much larger and longer one. The best way to end a relationship is cleanly. Don't drag a breakup out over weeks and months. Ex explain your reasons clearly. It's very likely the other person will be hurt, so minimize the damage, and if there's no hope of getting back together, say so. 
Don't jerk your ass around like a five-year-old with a yo-yo. And please, for the love of all things holy, break up in person. If that's not possible, do it over the phone. Never, ever, ever break up via email or text. Though you can use email to articulate your thoughts later. It's thoughtless, rude, and harmful. Not to mention cowardly as heck. On other fish in the sea. If you've ever been on the other end of that breakup, you know how painful it can be. It's like someone ripped off your face and smacked you in the head with it. Like being nibbled to death in slow increments by starving piranhas. Like having your intestines savaged by a grizzly. Basically, it's the feeling of your world falling apart. You might feel unloved and worthless. You'll probably feel like you should never date anyone ever again. You might even look into the possibility of becoming a man. Breakups are some of the most painful experiences we'll ever have. The last thing we want to hear about, uh, the last thing we want to hear after suffering a bad breakup when we can hardly eat and we've been holding back tears for a week straight is the phrase, there are other fish in the sea. Oh man, that's so obnoxious. So hopefully you're not actively dealing with heartbreak when I tell you this. If you are, feel free to skip ahead and come back to it later. It'll still be here. <coughs> there are other fish in the sea. There are other frogs in the pond. There are other jackrabbits in the desert. There are other hipsters in Brooklyn. People use this annoying cliche because it's true. When you're going through a breakup, it's hard to imagine going through the process all over again. Meeting someone, getting to know them, sharing your life, falling in love. But it does happen. And it will be just as magical, if not more so. And maybe this time it won't end with a broken heart. The younger you are, the more likely it is you'll find someone new. When I remember my first girlfriend in high school and recall the pain our breakup caused, it's almost funny now. It never would have worked out, but that relationship helped teach me what would work and the relationships after that worked out better and better until I finally found my wife. On marriage. I know a couple who have been married for over 30 years. They met in high school and lived across the street from each other. They had three kids and lived near where they grew up. They have a great story. But their story wasn't all rainbows and unicorns. Every relationship that has ever existed has been hard, and no couple stays together for 10 or 20 or 30 years without conflict. The secret of a good relationship is being prepared for this, and accepting the truth that a minor conflict is just going to bring you and your partner closer in the end, provided you can deal with it adequately and play fair. In fact, that's one of the things that made relationships so great. My friend gave me this advice on my wedding day, right as I was donning my tuxedo jacket. It will be the hardest thing you ever do, but as it goes on, you will look back and find you are a better person. The married couple I mentioned were high school sweethearts who stuck together no matter what, but they are a rare exception. There's no perfect age for getting married, but you will save yourself a lot of hard work if you know yourself by the time you say, I do. If I married the puppy I dated in high school, my life would look awfully different now, and probably rather awful. I wouldn't have been able to follow my dreams. I wouldn't have found a woman who is an infinitely better partner and has brought me so much happiness. It would have been very, very hard. And marriage is hard enough as it is, but don't worry. It's worth it. And just for the sake of saying this, Josh Ship in the book puts in parentheses, I love you, Sarah. And now I am going to go, because of how long that chapter was, I'm going to take a bit of a break real quick. I will be right back. I'm going to take a drink of this first, though.
Uh, okay, sorry about that. I'm sorry for that long wait. Uh, let's get back out of this book. We're almost to the end. To the end of this part, but the rest of part four is not. The part four is a bit short and it's up, but yeah, we got this. All right. <clears throat> Chapter 19. Chapter 19. How to dominate your school. Dominating your school is not about being the most popular or about being the best. It's about working your tail off. Surely I'm joking. I swear I'm not. Basic formula. You have to do what you have to do in order to do what you have in order to do what you want to do. In order to succeed with school, life, girls, boys, you have to put in the work. It's like how your parents make you get into the Brussels sprouts before you can cuddle up to some dessert. If that sounds grim, take a breath. It's not. Working out, working for what you want always feels good. It's like phys ed for the soul. Most common forms of villainy found in schools. Vampires, robots, zombies. Memorize this. You don't have to live life the way other people expect you to. I want to lay it out as plain as can be. High school, to college, to marriage, to 2.5 kids, plus a dog in the suburbs, plus a job you don't like, equals not necessarily the path you have to follow. Everyone else is doing it is generally not a great reason to hop in line. Remember, most people don't dominate their worlds. Most people aren't heroes. Ergo, most people aren't great examples to follow. You can be whatever you want to be. Do whatever you want to do. But your options are going to be really limited if you don't start making smart decisions now. You've got to think ahead. Sorry to break it to you, but your future isn't some nebulous spectacle looming in the distance. It starts today. Scratch that. It starts now. After all, if you don't know where you're going, how will, you, how will you know when you get there? In this respect, school is more than just a minimum security prison that serves chocolate chip cookies on the good days. Nope, there's a lot more to it than that, even if it's hard to tell sometimes. Basically, education is about prepare, preparation for something. Think about what you want to do. Anything. Iguana farmer, hot air balloon pilot, submarine captain, brain surgeon, lion tamer, cultural anthropologist, international diplomat, software developer. Okay, cool. Now, ask yourself how you got there. It's like Harry Potter wanted to be an Auror, right? He had to score at a certain level on a certain tests, or he would be forever disqualified, or at least severe, seriously disadvantaged. Approach your dream job with that mindset. And in the meantime, watch out for robots. Here's the thing. School can seem like a robot factory. From early on, you take standardized tests, filling in little bubbles on the paper which are fed into a machine that scores the test and tells you how you rank compared to the other robots. In every class, you are assigned a letter grade proving your uh, proficiency or a lack of proficiency in each subject, and this letter grade is the magical token that allows you to move up to the next level. The best robots go to college, which are more specialized factories. Here your database is uploaded with all manners of information so you too can calculate how to become a productive member of robot society. If you go to the finest robot colleges, you get extra robot points, so other robots will know immediately how well programmed you are. When you graduate, you march in the lines and roll over another conveyor belt where you are given another piece of paper saying you are a successful robot. There really is no way around this because other robots are constantly reminding you there is no other choice if you want to succeed. After that, you receive your third robot uniform, a shirt and a tie or a skirt if you are a girl. You bring in your pieces of paper to a job interview where a boss robot scans them and judges you based on what the papers say. Then he asks you robotic questions like, where do you see yourself in five years? Are you a team player? Do you take criticism well? Those last two are code for, are you a robot like us? And will you do whatever we tell you? 
If you're answering these questions in a way that computes positively to the boss robot, you will receive your job. You will be told when to arrive and what you will be doing. You will power on every morning and make your way diligently to giant holding, boy, holding bays, sometimes with tiny sectioned off robot rooms without ceilings or doors, so other robots can make sure you are operating properly. You will be you will set about producing staying, staying consistent. Here you'll be programmed to other robot sayings. When other robots ask you how you are on a Monday, you absolutely must say, what can I say? If it's a Monday, it, what can I say? It's a Monday. If it's a Thursday, you must say, what can I say? Thursday is almost Friday. Don't even get me started on the phrase hump day. It's not as fun as it sounds. But at any point, you can just turn your life around, right? You could quit and go down whatever you like. Sort of. But eventually, it will, it'll be too late to do anything else, and the programming will take over. You might even make excuses for yourself, saying it wasn't your fault that you ended up where you did. After all, you just followed the program given to you. Oh, sure, you might experience some tiny glitches in the program here and there. They're usually called midlife crises. A midlife crisis is a feeling that you have to get out, start living for your passions, make something of yourself, leave a legacy with your life. Most robots don't follow this instinct. They're ju they just buy a fast car to feel young again. But soon enough, you'll be back on the productive track, numbly plugging your way through another robot day. Truth be told, the world needs robots. It needs people to do mindless, excruciatingly dull work. How else will all that data be in inputted? How else will those reports be generated and filed correctly? How else will the phones get answered in the correct order they were received? How else will the time clocks be stamped and the correct monetary credits distributed to the correct robots efficiently? If you're lucky, maybe you'll get a few extra credits so you can buy bright, shiny robot accessories. There's always the chance you might short circuit and break down one day. More likely, though, you'll be replaced by the cheaper, faster, updated model. You'll eventually be removed from service, sent to the trash heap with, hopefully, enough credits to last a few more years. It won't matter, though, because you'll have spent so much time being a robot, you won't be programmed to do anything else. Not to worry, though. There's still work to be done. The robot holding bay will keep going as if you were never there. Depressing, huh? That's not to say school or college is bad, or that you're doomed to end up like a robot, to end up a robot. Most of the time, some form of education is critical for successful world domination. Here's my point. In your education, whether in high school, great trade school, college, or grad school, you've gotta keep your eye on the goal. A lot of times, you gotta do what you have to do in order to do, in order to do what you want. If you want to be a pilot, you've got to learn to fly a plane. You want to run a p company, you're probably going to want to acquire a few businesses, a few business or management skills. Never jump through hoops just because someone tells you to. But if the quickest, most logical way to get to your goal is to jump through hoops, well, so be it. Sometimes hoops need jumping through. One of those hoops is school. Education can make you feel like one of those yippy dogs in agility competitions. You yearn to run free through the woods, chasing squirrels and bounding through an open meadow after butterflies. Instead, you're stuck in some bizarro dog show competition with a demanding owner who dresses you in human clothes and forces you to run up and down ramps and through canvas tunnels for a treat. The fact is, education is necessary. I'm not just saying that because I have to say it or schools will stop inviting me to speak. I'm saying it I'm saying that because it's true. I'll give you three reasons. Reason number one, paper. My friend Mindy spent four years earning her bachelor's degree, three years working for a doctorate in physical therapy, and four years in medical school. In exchange, she has three pieces of paper. Don't get me wrong, they're fancy pieces of paper with gold stamps and signatures. They are also pieces of paper the same way keys are pieces of metal. They unlock doors. Those pieces of paper do not prove you are smart. 
They don't prove normal strength or physical prowess or a brilliant sense of humor. What a diploma proves is that you are willing to work hard. That's why so many jobs require college degrees, and why most every, every other job out there requires at least a high school diploma. A degree shows that a person is willing to bear down and get to get the work done, to spend hours studying a subject they're not interested in. It proves they are prepared to do what it takes to follow their dream. Reason number two. You might actually learn something. Like the dog in an agility competition, we can view our education in two ways. We can view it as a prison, a seemingly endless series of rituals and hoops intended to mold us into what society deems appropriate. Or we can view it as training to make us better, and when we do finally hit that open meadow, we'll be able to make the most of our experience. Now, you can spend all of your time sprinting and frolicking through the wildflowers. Number th reason number three, it's good for your brain. Education, the whole process of packing your head with various quantities of useful and sometimes not so useful information generally makes you smarter. Not necessarily because of all the stuff you know, but because you actually had a thing to get the work done. So even if you don't give a squirrel's fluffy tail about a generic, about geometric proofs or neoclassical art, at the end of the day, if you've done your homework, your brain probably works a little better. World Domination Challenge Are you willing to live the next two to three years of your life like most people won't so you can live the next 20 to 30 years like many people never will? In other words, are you willing to do what you have to do in order to do exactly what you want? If you can answer yes to that question, what types of things can you do in the next two to three years to make progress? Well-rounded is overrated, but it still helps. Along the way, even when it comes to subjects we don't care about, we learn perspective. We can do this by looking for connections to subjects we are interested in. Maybe you couldn't give a rip about how your early 20th century diplomacy and ethnic tensions in the Balkan, st Balkan states ignited World War I, but there are lessons in history that could lead you to fresh angles in programming, or medicine, or any other career field. At the very least, a wide range of knowledge enables you to communicate better. I've never been a fan of math. Outside of tip calculations and tax filings, I don't use it much. Years ago, I read a book called Zero, The Biography of a Dangerous Idea by Charles Safe. The book talked about the, the history of the number zero. Long ago, humans didn't see things in terms of zero. In fact, zero was considered evil. There was no reason for zero. Either you had something or you didn't. If someone asked you how much land you owned, you wouldn't say, I have zero land. They'd probably drown you for being a witch if you said it like that. Fortunately, the book didn't have much math, but it was still about numbers. Since then, I've met a number of people who relished math in the school the way I relished making smart aleck comments to the teacher. On the surface, we haven't had much in common, so I'll bring up that book, and it usually sparks a fascinating conversation. The book connected my interests, history, to subjects of my blind spot, math, and now links me to great friends I never would have known otherwise. Everybody wins. Hey, teachers, leave those kids alone. Of course, education isn't always fun. We've, had, we've all had teachers who drone on and on with the enthusiasm of a stone tree sloth or courses that threaten to drown us in assigned writing and homework. Bad teachers are the most difficult pitfall, so I suggest avoiding them altogether if it's within your power, and hey, sometimes it's not. Ask around for suggestions on professors and teachers who are particularly skilled and get a jump on scheduling them since they'll likely be popular. When it comes to difficult classes though, don't dismiss them. Sometimes the hardest classes are the best. My friend Sean was now was not particularly good at school. He graduated from high school with a 2.6 GPA, even though he had higher SAT scores than anyone I knew. His senior year, he took an honors English class that was widely considered the hardest course in the school. During the summer break, the teacher required the students read four books from a list, including The Fountainhead by Ayn Rand. The Fountainhead, in case you haven't read it, is 311,596 pages long, 
approximately ten times longer than this book. It's about an architect, and most of it focuses on a philosophical concept known as objectivism. There are no gunfights, only one explosion, and a very weird sex scene. Tough read. During the year, the class read through 12 Shakespeare plays and had three essays due weekly, along with a series of other books. It was the hardest class Sean had ever taken, and far harder than anything I've ever studied. At the end of the semester, in a class of 30 honors students, only three people earned an A. Sean, who had averaged a C over the span of his high school career, was one of them. It wasn't until years later that Sean decided he wanted to be a writer, but that ruling class was one of his biggest inspirations. For a guy who was awful at busy work, the kick to the head his honors English class provided was just what he needed. If you can't be just another brick in the wall. Some people are suited to study, to plow through a mountain of homework without a moment of procrastination. They churn out straight A's like a conveyor belt. They aren't necessarily robots, they're just extremely good at directing their brain functions to toward one particular goal. To others, the school system just doesn't seem to work. My hand is up right now, FYI, ADD, class clown, a little chubby, bullied a lot. School was a th treat for me, but I survived. We're all different, and big public and private schools can seem suited only for the select few who would love nothing more than to read textbooks on a Saturday night. Guys like my friend Sean, who is one of the smartest people I know, can slip through the cracks. If you're worried, if you're, worried you're one of those people, you should remember there are other options. You should speak to your academic counselors first, but if your public or private school just doesn't seem to be working, there are all sorts of alternative learning programs or schools that focus on more individual learning habits. If you're not sure what approach to take, talk to your parents openly about your fears about your education. Not every school is a robot factory, especially when you stand out as an individual. Chapter 20. How to Dominate Your Career Raise your hand if you really want to work in a factory. Pauses to count. Mm. Okay, you guys go pursue that. The rest of you, figure out what you want and start planning for, the, for that future now. The average adult person is awake for 14 to 16 hours per day. For half that time, the average person is working at a job. There are obvious exceptions. Some people have to wear two jobs just to get by. Some people live off trust funds and do nothing but swim through gold-plated vaults of personal wealth all day. Scrooge style. Some people live in their parents' basement until their mom kicks them out. During the math from above, we see the average person sleeps about 33% of their life. If you factor in weekends, this means the average American spends 34% of his or her waking life at work. That's a huge chunk of your life. 34%. If we're going to seriously discuss dominating your world, you better believe that you are going to have to dominate your career. If you don't, that 34% will be painful and boring. And more specifically, it will be 34% of your life that you spend doing the tasks of your, robot, of your robot bosses. Most common forms of villainy at work. Robots, ninjas, zombies. This chapter will explain how to dominate your career. Pay attention, because this is a big one. 34% big. When I grow up, I don't want to be a da da da. When you're young, it's easy to say you want to be a fireman or a princess because those seem to be the only options. But the older you get, the more things open up and the more confusing choosing the path becomes. Think of all the thousands of jobs out there. Then think about all the variations on each of those jobs. You can't just be a teacher or a doctor. You have to know which subject you'll teach and what grade. Or you'll have to know which minute segment of the body you're going to practice medicine on, like the brain or the toenails. And those are just two possible careers. It's enough to make you curl up in a corner and weep for the end. What's worse, there's so much pressure to decide right now. No, not later. Now. The way your teach bots and council bots talk, what you eat for lunch, for any given day, to permanently banish, to permanently banish you from a decent college, which will keep you out of your perfect job, 
which means that no one will ever love you because you are miserable and you'll end up sitting on a sidewalk complaining home, completely homeless and remembering that fateful day you chose to sloppy joe over the chicken sandwich. Easy, Tyler. Here's the truth. They're a little, they're, they're a little bit right. The decisions you make now, from the brains you get to how you treat others, affect your options down the road. It's definitely not the end of the line if you turn off course, but knowing where you're going gives you a huge advantage, because you're thinking about steps others aren't. Or as the treasure cat in Alice in Wonderland says, if you don't know where you are going, then it doesn't matter which way you go. Here's how to get out of that fetal position. Brush yourself off and start moving. Think backward. I know it's weird, but think about it. Say there are four jobs in the world. You could be a princess, a fireman, or a badger wrangler, or you can clean out toilets for a living. If you're a dude, you can't be a princess. It just won't happen, no matter how many times you kiss a toad. See how easy that was to cross off the list? That leaves fireman, badger wrangler, and toilet cleaner. Do you like toilets? Do you like dealing with human excrement? I didn't think so. Voila! Your choices have been cut in half. Now what do you like better? Running into burning buildings or training badgers to become actors on the big and small screen? It's that simple. Okay, it's not that simple, but it's a start. It's not as if you can list every job in the world and scratch them out one by one. Think of it more broadly than that. Do you see yourself working in an office or would you rather be outside? Are you comfortable working for a boss or do you want to run your own business? Hey, if you can't see yourself working for someone else, you've crossed off a list of potential careers, my friend. World Domination Challenge To find out what you do want to do with your life, you have to find out what you don't want to do with your life. Take a minute and list five or more things you know you never ever want to do with your life. Be specific. If you can do five, list five more. Keep going as long as you can. Pay to play? Now that we've eliminated jobs like Pizza Delivery Boy and Garbage Man, though garbage men tend to make a great living and pizza delivery isn't a bad thing when you're young, it's time to explore what careers are left. To do that, you'll have to consider what you're good at. You also need to consider what you enjoy doing. This isn't quite as easy as it sounds because you might really enjoy eating junk food all night and playing Call of Duty 4. Think more about what you feel fulfilled by. Maybe it's drawing, music, math, or speaking in front of others. It's when something is so fun you don't consider it work even if others do. That's how you break free of the robot mentality. The robot mentality tells you your career should be work. Robots tell you to work your fingers to the bone for 8 hours a day in return for a tiny paycheck. Robots tell you to have fun when you're clocked out, never on company time. What they won't tell you, because they don't want to admit it to themselves, is that there are people out there making money doing exactly what they love. They are peop they are, there are people out there using their drawing skills to chart out buildings or to sketch comic books. There are rock stars and country musicians and team pop sensations. There are mathematicians doing whatever it is awesome mathematicians do. There are people like me who used to be in class clowns now getting paid money to speak at schools, the same places I used to get kicked out of. There are even people getting paid to chug Mountain Dew and play Call of Duty 4. They may die young, but they will die happy. That This is the ultimate end goal. Awesomeness tip. Find something in life you love to do so much that you would actually do it for free. Then, here's the good part, Learn to do it so well that you get paid for doing it. Josh Shipp. If you want to be a guitar player, you need to play your guitar. A lot. More than anyone else. It doesn't matter if you don't know two chords when you start, because you will if you work at it. Eventually, you're going to get so good, people will have to pay you. Honestly, they'll look at you and they'll be jealous and they'll say, Well, I suppose I have to give you this sack of cash. You're just too good. And remember, playing guitar doesn't mean you have to be packing out full stadiums on an international tour. It could mean that you get to be a studio musician, a songwriter who writes for other musicians, a guitar teacher, 
an artist who helps write songs for soundtracks of movies. The options are endless. Sometimes this means you won't be well-rounded. I mean, no one expects LeBron James to be an expert in algebra or 17th century Middle Eastern politics. People expect LeBron James to ball. Does that mean he can be a jerk to blow off everything but basketball? No. But it does mean LeBron James should spend a lot of time on the court because that's what he loves. That's what he's really good at, and that's what makes him feel fulfilled. Hopefully you can narrow things down a bit more. Maybe you've thought of four or five other four or five things you're really good at that you also enjoy. But maybe you're still not sure what your ultimate career will be, or you're a little afraid to get started. That's completely understandable. We're just getting started too. Awesomeness tip. The hard part isn't figuring out what you're good at. It's having the courage to go for it, regardless of what any villain says to you. Josh Shipp. World Domination Challenge. What dream or job would you try if you knew 100% there was absolutely no way you would ever fail? Write it down. Be specific. Just do it. Here's what you do now. You start doing these things. Those things. Don't wait. Sometimes we have a tendency to pull up, put off pursuing our goals until the absolute perfect time. There are so many things holding us back after all. There's school and soccer practice and family guy is on at 7.30. Sometimes there's nothing going on, but you just don't feel like it. It's as if you have a magical fairy that comes down, comes down and puts your soft little hat telling you, and pats your soft little hat telling you, it's okay. One day you'll be able to spend your time doing what you love. Don't worry about it right now. You can do it later. Maybe you should go back to playing Xbox. Really though, that magical fairy is a type of ghost. It's playing off the fears that have crept into your past by reminding you about the possibility of failure in your future. This fairy ghost is trying to keep you from doing what you love by reminding you how you might fail. She's hoping that you'll listen and put things off until it's too late. You need to grab that fairy by its frilly little fairy down and punch it squarely in the mouth. You hear me? No more waiting. It's go time. If you love playing video games, start learning all you can about how they're made. Learn who the big software companies are and start thinking about what made certain games epic and other games boring. Think about what sort of storylines work in a game and what characters you like best. Start writing down game ideas in a notebook. Talk to your friends about games to find out what they like. Spend time reading game reviews and magazines. Do you want to be a game programmer? A writer? A critic? An animator? There are so many options for you get to choose from. If you love to play if you love playing music, practice. Pick up those drumsticks or that guitar. Take music classes in school. Take private lessons. Pick up songs and albums from bands you like, then explore music. Webs music websites or iTunes for bands you don't know so well. Play until your fingers bleed. Not because you have to, but because you want to, and nothing makes you feel more fulfilled. Same goes for writing and math and cooking and sports and law enforcement and whatever else. The more you practice your skills, the more involved you get, the better you become. Remember, too, that you're, that you're working toward a goal. Maybe you won't like you won't always like the bands you you hear as you branch out, but you're listening to them because you want to be the best musician you can be, and it's research. The more you know about this skill, the better off you will be. While you're working, pay attention to how you feel. Does playing guitar make you feel strong? Not like muscle strong, but emotionally and mentally strong. Could you play guitar for the rest of your life? If so, giddy up. If not, move on to a different skill. Don't spend the rest of your life playing the tar because you were afraid to try something different. That's not to say there won't be difficult days, even in your dream job. There will, trust me. But if you're not feeling strong anymore when, the pre when you practice your skill, move on. In the end, this is the only thing you can control. You can't make people love your music. You can't force people to watch your dance ballet. You can't force people to read your comic book or watch the movie you made. But you can work your butt off. And if you are that committed, I truly believe that you will get so good at your talent 
and you will have people showing up to listen, to watch, to read. You'll have people who can't help but love you. As for this tip, even if you're on the right track, you'll get run over if you just sit there. Will Rogers. Finding friends in high places. Finding friends in high places. Now that you're mastering your future career, it's time to address one of the best parts of dominating your career. Making friends. Also see chapter 17. People, typically pirates, used to believe that everyone was on his or her own. That you reach the top only by outwitting, outplaying, and outlasting your opponents. All of whom are stranded on a desert island and split into two tribes with strange names. Forced to compete in challenges for scarce resources, immunity, a million bucks, and the title of sole survivor. But that's not true. No one makes it on his or her own. We all need community around us to lift us up when we're down. We need others to help us. Remember just a second ago when I said hard work is the only thing you can control? There's something else you can do that will help. Make friends who like the things you like. In your career, your allies are your greatest asset. Almost every great hero has allies. From Robin Hood to Rainbow Bright to Optimus Prime. Think of it like this. How many people do you know? How many people do you would you consider friends? Let's say the number is 20. The thing is, those 20 people each have 20 friends who you don't know. So in a sense, you're a friend of a friend of 400 people. That's math, not magic. Of those 400 people, maybe there are a few who can find you opportunities in your career, but the odds get better the more people you know. It's not all about connections, though. And you definitely don't want to connect with someone with only, only for the betterment of your career. That makes you a social climber, which is completely lame and smells like ninjas and pirates. That means you are dominating someone else's world for your own benefit. You just broke rule number two. Now, it's easy to go uh, to say go out and find a hundred friends, but how do you go about becoming friends with people who like what you like? You go out. Like music? Go to music venues or music shops. Like math? Go to math club. Get it? You can also go bowling or to a coffee shop or any number of things. But wherever you go, you'll meet people. We covered this more in chapter 17. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. Besides being characters in famous movies, what do Luke Skywalker, Darth Vader, the Karate Kid, and the X-Men have in common? They all had mentors. Luke, Luke had Obi-Wan Kenobi and Yoda. Darth Vader had Obi-Wan and Obi -Wan Kenobi and Yoda too, but then he bailed on them for the Emperor, who falls under the category wrong crowd. The Karate Kid had Mr. Miyagi. The, the, the X-Men had Professor Xavier. If you want to dominate your own career, you'll need, you'll need a mentor too. If you want to be a rock star, though, you might have a hard time. It's not like Chris Martin and Pete Wentz are holding open auditions for protégés. That's okay. Mentors don't have to be Rich or Mary Ashley Simpson. They need to be smart people you respect, who maybe know a thing or two about leading you in the right direction. As long as it's not a guy who lives in a van and wears a trench coat all summer, you're probably good. You know how to get a mentor? Ask. That's all. Compared to everything else you have to do to dominate, it's fairly easy. Most people, if they aren't enormous jerks or extremely busy, will be happy to help and guide you. At the very least, they can email you some advice. All you need to do is find someone with similar skills to you who has some experience in the field. Even if you don't know anyone who works in the career you want to pursue, there's this whole network of information that flies back and forth through a mystical field called cyberspace. It's called the internet. So you go online and you surf your way to the right site. Let's say you're still trying to be a video game designer. Find a video game company you like and send them an email. All you have to say is, my name is your name. I want to become a video game designer. Is there a video game designer I could email to get advice on following my dream? It's not like you even have to meet them. 
I mean, stranger danger still applies, but at least you can get insight from someone who's been there via email or a phone call. If you're fortunate enough to know someone who works in your chosen career, ask them. There's a 97% chance they'll love to help. Maybe you can even shadow them around at their job. R-E-S-P-E-C-T Considering that you could very well be entering a career field full of robots, you need to know what you are walking into. And to do that, we should look at a little espionage or spying. Now, contrary to popular belief, the best spies are not James Bond. They don't wear tuxedos, they don't drive cars with machine guns hidden in the headlights, or shoot their way out of situations. The best spies understand the culture they are entering. They use the customs and languages of the other countries to get what they want. They use their ability to relate to their surroundings. This means you need to understand the world around you. You need to, un you need to listen and respect others. Kind of like a ninja only with a heart of gold. So more like a sneaky samurai. This is how you build connections and network with people who can help you. Even robots. The more you understand these villains, the easier it becomes to dodge their attacks. This is how you get a job. This is how you lay on the interview. Things like good handshakes, and good equals firm, dressing nicely and speaking clearly may seem old-fashioned. Really though, they show confidence. If you're dressed well, it shows you clear enough about the job to put on a nice shirt for once. If you speak clearly, others will understand and listen to you. If you make eye contact, it shows you you're it shows you're not afraid of the person you're speaking with. If you are if you are reliable and come to an interview or meeting ten minutes early, it shows you are someone others can depend on. If you can do these things, your first impression is already taken care of. These seem like a little things, but they're bigger than you think. Trust me on this. Showing and earning respect isn't just about appearances and your grip, though. It also means listening. You know, paying attention to the other person. It means asking questions. If you're naturally outgoing, slow down. Learn about the other person. If you're shy, that's okay too, because then it's easy to sit and listen. This isn't about faking your way through life or manipulating people so they'll help you. It's about being genuinely interested in, in others. If you engage them and allow them to tell their stories, they will like you. If you respect them and treat them with kind work, with kindness, they'll treat you the same way. Most of the time. But you know what? Even when they don't treat you well, your actions will not go unnoticed. All these tips go double during job interviews. That's when you need to present yourself at your absolute best. Along with all those nice cities and manners of fancy shirts and ties, it's important to be prepared. Think about the questions you're likely to face. Hiring managers like to ask about five-year plans and what you feel your biggest weakness is. Here's a freebie, do not do not mention laziness. The secret tip, though, is to do some research on where you're interviewing. Read up on what they do, how they work. Anything you can possibly learn about the company. Then when the manager asks, Now, do you have any questions for us? They always do this, and it is to test to see how interested you are. You say, yes, I noticed that as of May, in May of, yes, I noticed in May of 2007, your company posted its high, highest quarterly profits. Did you say that was due to increased consumer confidence or to changes in the federal tax system, which subsequently subsidized what farm, wheat farming in Nebraska? Maybe that question isn't all that great. The point is, you've read up. You know what you're walking into, just like the spy. You know the culture, you know the history. You're one of them. You show that sort of thinking, and they'll love you for it. The two-year gap. This is all well and good, you may be saying inside your mind, but or, or maybe even outside your mind, to which a passerby may react strangely. That guy's talking to a book! But maybe you're just not there yet. Maybe you're just shadowed, maybe you've shadowed a doctor throughout a day in the emergency room and dealing with blood and guts is not for you. This happened to me. Yeah, laugh it up. Me and my crazy hair wanted to be a doctor. Me, uh, maybe you rode along with a cop and while wearing a gun seemed cool, you weren't so into that uniform. 
Maybe you were the assistant to a traveling street musician for one day, and felt pulling quarters from kids' ears wasn't your thing. Maybe you've done all these things, and you're still not sure what you want to do. Maybe this happens the day after you graduate from high school or college. Do not panic. Your life is not over. You are not a failure. You just haven't found a dream to follow. If that's the case, here's your tip it out. Take the two-year gap. Here's how the two-year gap works. Make no financial commitments. Don't buy a car or anything that's going to get you into debt. Drop your standard of living as fast as, as far as it'll go. Instead of caviar and lobster, eat some Trader Joe's macaroni and cheese. You know, the one with the white cheddar. Then use what funds you do have to do everything you can. Water, wait tables, go to art shows, read books for fun, and learn a variety of stuff on your own terms. Intern at places that sound interesting. Travel. That sound interesting. Travel. Hit the road for a bit and see what's out there. The goal here is input. Get input from everyone you can. Ask to hear everyone's story. Absorb all the experience like a sham while sucking up a spill. If in two years you still haven't found something that excites you, which makes you want to dive in then, well, you might be on your own, but this is unlikely. If you do find something, and I'm willing to put money on the fact that you will, start digging in. Try the whole job shadow thing again, or read books on how to get there. If, after all this time, you find your real passion is being a garbage man, remember to pay, then it's time to learn how to make it happen. Good versus great. Let's say it's a few years down the line. You worked your way through an internship, and you're dancing and prancing your way into a profession that, made, that gives you a real purpose. You paid your dues, and you're riding along a bar, like a barnacle on the great titanic of waste management, or rock stardom, or video game designer done. Maybe you've got a little, you've got a solid little flow of income, and you're thinking, I'm done doing what I love. Hooray! Well, you've accomplished more than what the world expected. expected. You've been good. You've become good. Above average. If you're working in a career you love, you're doing something a large chunk of the population will never realize. You deserve a milkshake for all your hard work, don't you? You deserve crumbled Oreos in that milkshake. While you're sitting there sucking down your fancy above average milkshake, someone should hand you an award that says, Good job, you're above average. You can read it while you slurp. Wrong! This is my number one qualm with life. You know what above average is? You know what good is? I'll tell you. Let's say average is here. I'm putting my hand out on a line at about at about my lap my lip level. Uh, wait, what? Uh, at about my mouth level. Here above average, I'm moving my hand up to my upper lip. Here's that. Here's good. Now my hand is right at the tip of my nose. This would have worked better if you could see me. Because it's a really vis vivid visual tool. <clears throat> the point is, that's not good enough. I don't even care if you move up to eye level. Never settle for in for above revenge. Never settle for good. A lot of people out there think good is enough, and maybe it is for them. It should be noted for you. I don't want to s sound like your overbearing mil ex-military father here, but the world needs greatness. Too many people settle for less. There are going to be voices from inside and out. They'll tell you you're not good enough or you're doomed to crumble. There will be voices that will tell you to give up. They'll tell you to take the easy route. They'll tell you to settle. Then every so often there will be a, rate, a voice that says, You're the best person in the world to do this. There's not one in the world better equipped. Not only can you do this, you can be the best. You can change the world, the people around you, your family, because this is what you were made to do. And that voice, the voice, or the one listening to you to, the, to drive on because you'll own this, that voice is true. That's the voice to listen to. Awesomeness tip. I've missed more than 9,000 shots of my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot and missed. I've failed over and over and over again in my life. 
And that is why I succeed. Alright. So... Hmm. I may just have to... Uh, what time is it, anyway? Yeah, I may just have to... Honestly, cut it short a bit. But, here's what I'll do. If I do have time tomorrow... Uh, as in today... Before my li my birthday celebration stream... If I have ta any time enough to do... To finish the rest of this book... I'm going to. And if not, I will do it after my birthday stream. Uh, so yeah. Uh, I'm going to have to go ahead and end it there. Kind of abrupt, but at least it's at the end of a chapter. And we're almost at the section, but I'm going to stop. But I just want to stop there for the night. All right. So tomorrow or the day after, I will, be, I will, I will actually be finishing this book. For real this time. I know my previous community post may seem like clickbait, but this time I will be finishing the rest of this book either tomorrow or um, either tomorrow or the day after. Whichever works. Whichever whichever time works best for me. In any event, thank you guys so much for watching this reading uh, of this book. Thank you guys so much for watching. Hope you guys enjoyed this reading. And if and until next time, this is Forrest Walpole signing off.